Hello, Yeshua Network. Hey guys, <laughs> welcome to another entire Bible read through. <laughs> Blessed to be here with you, as always. <laughs> Thank you guys for your patience as I was dealing with my bug, my bug that I had in my head and my lungs. But I am doing much better. My voice is still a little weird. I might have a cough once or twice, but I'm good to me. I, I think I sound very good. Thank you very much. It's kind of a nice, deep, sick voice. It's really good. I like it. Yeah. So it's really nice. You guys did a great job on the comments. We're very uh, excited to um, go over what you guys have put in the hard work on this chapter, Luke 2, um, the birthing of our Messiah. Always a good part of the story. Yeah. Thank God. For the birthing of the oh Messiah, my so goodness. that the rest of it could happen. Amen. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so, yeah. Um, should we dive right in? We have a general comment. I'll read the first one. My my, my brother Yang. Sorry okay. about that, guys. Le I'm... Leo. Yes, you are. Yeah, I am. You ready? You have I coffee. am a person. I'm you're a human be, being. I think you're gonna be jazz in like ten minutes. All right, here we go. Yeah, and coffee, guys. This is going to be crazy. It's going to be a crazy night right now. No, okay. So general comment to kick it off. Uh, oh, and just real quick. Sorry for those who watch it recorded. Uh, the meetup coming up at the end of this month. I'm very excited about it. Everything is on schedule. Hope you guys are coming. If you can come, you know, if you still want to come, you can come. But you got to fill out the uh, form for us. Let us know you're coming. The form is on the meetup group at Facebook. And... Uh, Yes, we are still a Facebook-based uh, page. Uh, you know, there's there's got to be some kind of design there with uh, with the Lord's uh, desire there for that. So, uh, because that seems to be where we're finding everybody. So, I feel a lint. I don't have my Yeshua hat. I just noticed that as I looked. I'm so sad. I accidentally <laughs> wore the wrong hat. Okay, first general comment as we kick but it you off. you got your Yeshua shirt. I do. I got my Be The, be the Light, light. Shirt. So this is And good. it says in the back, Yeshua loves me. Oh, yes. Do you guys... Oh, you can't see it really. I'm too squishy. Okay. Too squishy. Leo, general comment. Luke 1 and 2 about the birth of Yeshua in these two chapters and in others concerning the birth of Yeshua, all the actors and functions uh, that the Lord invites are presented and described. Mary, the woman, carries in her womb the divine child, Yeshua. Elizabeth, the woman, carries in her womb the man, John the Baptist, who will be the first to be destined for the Great Commission. The king's men responsible before the Lord to take care of the nations of men and women. Simeon, the man, the prophet, and uh, announcing future things of importance, and the woman, the prophet, prophetess, pro prophetess. Pro prophetess, I like to make up words, uh, discreet and submissive to the work of the Lord, the shepherds, men and their lambs, male and female, oxen, male, sacrificing themselves, for the atonement of men and women, the donkey, the colt's father, the one who carries Yeshua beside his mother for his in entry into the Jerusalem, the angel bearing the message, and the host of heaven singing praise to the Lord and peace of mankind, and Yeshua the first in the temp, uh, Yeshua the first in the temple, and the last in the manger, considering each one, each human being, man and woman, in the same way. I can see, feel, and recognize the glory of the Lord. It's like a dance of all those whom the Lord calls in the song of his glory. Amen. That's beautiful. It's a very, very well capsulated uh, visual of, a, the, of the chapter. It's been a well theme done. lately what? when talking about God, that the Lord works as a symphony. Oh, it's yeah. not just one instrument playing. It's it's so many All things happening at the same time. Amen. That's very true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Edward, Edward Laduca. I hope I got your name right. Forgive me if not. Hello, EBRT. I think this is my first time commenting, but I found your channel at the beginning of Lent last year and went through your forty day prayer challenge. Then I found and have become to really to enjoy EBRT with the rest of you. I listen to the chapters and then the videos almost every morning. Mm. I just got to the end of Psalms and felt compelled to share this message to add to the discussion on the term blessings. I hope to catch up with you before the finish, before you finish the entire Bible. Either way, I thank Jehovah for all of you uh, and pr pray you are overflowing with his blessings. Amen. You too. Thanks, Edward. We loved your message. Really yeah. did. 
And Ricardo says in uh, response, love this comment. It is going to make Nathan very emotional and blessed. <laughs> Um, Edward says, thanks, praise Jehovah. Karen says, it's a blessing to Nathan for sure, but for all of uh, of the usual suspects to have new people commenting. Yeah. That's right. You don't just bless, you know, Nathan or myself or yeah. all of us feel blessed by everybody's comments. Yeah. We're, mm -hmm. we're, when, when, when you, when you're a part of something like this, when you're a part of the Lord, you know, blessing a group of people you only get more happy when more people show up to be blessed. Exactly. It's it's not like where you're suddenly like, oh, don't, no, 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 I, this is just for us. Don't, no, 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 it's completely, that's completely works in the opposite direction. It's not like a limited cake <laughs> yeah. where everybody just wants their piece and make sure they get one. It's it's an, it's an a cake that grows with every exponentially piece you give away. with every, exactly, with every piece you give away. That's a good analogy. I like that. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, God. Oh, yeah. Um, Mary Rainey says, so glad to have you adding to the conversation. Hope you will join us for the live EVRTs on Wednesday nights at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And Edward says, thank you and blessings. Yes. Uh, Dina says, Luke 2. Wow, there is so much in this chapter. Where does one even begin? <laughs> Very true. Yeah. And we will do our best to start at the beginning and work yep. our way through. So, yeah. Yeah. Teamwork makes that holy dream work. Yep. Woo <coughs> uh, you want to read this one because uh, actually go to... ahead my you to... okay go ahead. gilda gilda <coughs> um, <clears throat> it's not you it's me go ahead. yes gilda luke 2 general comment mm -hmm. ever since i realized that every single word in the bible is there for a specific purpose and good reason i find myself being even more meticulous when reading especially the second time through for example at the beginning of luke chapter 2 taxes are mentioned I thought back to perhaps it correlating to when the Pharisees were asking Yeshua if they should pay taxes or not, and he asked them for a coin and proceeded to tell them to give to the image of the coin what is his, Caesar, and to give to God what is God's. Also, the fact that the earth is God's footstool, yet there wasn't room at the inn for the birth of God incarnate, is something that blew my mind. And everything having to do with Yeshua drips humility. Mm -hmm. Maybe he exemplifies that so well since he hates pride so much. Mm -hmm. Well said, Gilda. Yeah. Well said. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, can you scroll down? Dan Richardson, why Bethlehem and why the uphill arduous 90-mile trek for Mary? Luke 2.1. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This shows how God uses all people in service of his will. Augustus required all to return to their ancestral homes to be registered. Had he not done this, Yeshua would not have been born in Bethlehem in fulfillment of scripture. Uh, Mac, uh, Micah? Or Mac, uh, Mike? Mike, maybe it's, no, it's not Mike. Is it Micah? No. It is initial, so I'm blanking. It, it, Ma it's not Malachi, because that's M A L. Micah. Micah, yeah. yeah, it is Micah. Okay, yeah. Micah 5 2. Uh, uh, Micah 5 2, yeah. But you, O Bethlehem, uh, Euphrath, Euphrath, Ephratha, 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 um, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Then Lynn D says, good question. All I know is that the words we read are not just words. We all, he always leads us to a deeper meaning and relationship with him. In Hebrew, Bethlehem, uh, which means house of bread. Beth by Beth house, lechem, bread. Uh, Apretha, fruitfulness. Uh, I also heard that at this time, this is where they kept the lambs for the sacrificial offerings. And it is said that the lambs are only born one time of the year in April. I'm not 100% sure it was quite a while ago, but I heard this, but find it pretty fascinating. Yeah, I'm under the understanding and persuasion that he was born in April myself because of some other things that point towards April as well. So that's interesting. Your reference of um, uh, Micah 5.2 reminds me of Matthew 23.12, 1 Peter 5.5-6, 5, 5 and Luke 14.11. 
For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Hebrews 7, 11 through 17. Now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of, of Melchizedek, rather than one name after the order of Aaron? For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. For the one of whom these things are spoken belonged to another tribe, for which no one has ever served at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord has discerned from Judah, and in connection with the tribe Moses said nothing about priests. This becomes even more evident when another priest ra- uh, arises in the likeliness excuse me, in the likeness of Melchizedek who has become a priest not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of the indestructible life, for it is is witness of him. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Just look up the festivals. Passover is what is celebrated in April. Jaw dropped. This adds a richness, oh, Ann Summers replies to that. She says, this adds a richness to the words in, uh, uh, I think, in the words. And so she says, thanks. And Mary says, I posted a comment about the possibility of Yeshua being born during the Feast of Tabernacles, but you bring up another possibility here with him being born at Passover. Uh, a case could be made either way, but I feel pretty confident that he was born on one of those biblical holidays because that's just the way he works. Dina says, and how fitting that the sacrificial lamb of God would be born in a manger of all places. I also read somewhere that this was the manger where sacrificial lambs for the temple were birthed and that the shepherds knew exactly where to go because there was only one manger in Bethlehem where this took place. Apparently, When the newborn lambs were born, they were wrapped in swaddling cloth to keep them calm and without defect. Oh, that makes sense because they can't be blemished. In order for them to be suitable for the sacrifice, my mind was blown when I read this. Yeah, that is an awesome note, you guys. Wow, that is a really cool note. There's also the... um, God, that's so good. 40 days after... uh, Is it exactly 40 days after the last day of Passover or something like that? Sukkot? The yes, other the festival or the uh, holiday of that's the that's where Pentecost is. So mm-hmm. that could have been hmm. usually that's a May thing, though, not an April thing. Right. Yeah. Usually Pentecost. Yeah. Yeah. That's a May thing. Awesome comments, you guys. Um, I'm going to Google it just to be sure, because I have not for some reason, my brain is blanking. I have not been sleeping good since I got sick, so my brain is not it is not sharp right now, you guys, so I'm not going to uh, try to make any verbal mistakes. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, Ricardo says, Kenny, Kenny Loggins should, have, should make a Christmas album called Highway to the Manger Zone. <laughs> yeah. Highway it is to is the Manger Zone. Oh, I like that's it. good. Well, well played there. Um... Yeah. Prior, Mary Mary Rainey, previous chapter comment, Luke 1. Okay, this is a Ricardo length comment. Whoa. Nice. Whoa. Okay, here we go. Okay. Uh, um, I do apologize to whoever has to read this. It's all right. I'm used to it. LOL. <laughs> but I thought this information would be both important enough and interesting enough to make sure that it gets mentioned before we move on to Luke, Luke 2. It's a few scriptures that provide clues to the time of year for the birth of Christ, which has nothing to do with December 25, the Christmas holiday, for anyone who is unaware of that. Christmas was originally a winter solstice pagan worship holiday that became Christianized, a Christianized holiday by the Roman Emperor Constantine in the 4th century AD. However, these scriptures provide some proof that Yeshua's actual birth season likely coincides with one of the major biblical feast days or holidays. All of the major biblical holidays that were established by Yahweh in the Old Testament are important for current believers today because they foreshadow future events, events that either occurred in the New Testament time or will occur sometime in the future. Just real quick, Mary, I want to say thank you for this comment already, and I'm glad it is long because I feel like it's got tremendously awesome info. Mm. These feasts 
um, uh, these feast days are like prophecy. Yes, exactly. They predict the timing of future events, mm -hmm. and this is one reason why they are important. For example, the Passover holiday celebrated by Jews today originated in the Old Testament, see Exodus 12, when the Jews were spared the judgment by the death angel on their households if they spread the blood of the sac of a sacrificial lamb on the on the two doorsteps two doorposts of their of their homes if they did this the the angel of death passed over them likewise yeshua was crucified exactly on the passover holiday he became the fulfillment of the sacrificial lamb whose blood was shed on the cross so that judgment would pass over us the first event overshadowed the second event likewise the holiday called Shavuot otherwise known as Pentecost which comes exactly 50 days or seven weeks after Passover is also a Jewish holiday see Leviticus 22 23 this is a harvest festival celebrating first, first fruits. fruits on the same exact holiday the Apostles were gathered together in an upper room see Acts chapter 2 and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and empowered to preach in languages that they had never spoken before as a result 3,000 souls were added to them um, there were the first they these were the first fruits the first of those who came to believe in Christ so it's not a coincidence that these major important events happened on major Jewish holidays that were prescribed by Yahweh for Jews to celebrate in the Old Testament these holidays become testimonies to the things that Yahweh was doing in the New Testament, and the story will continue into the future. Yes, it will. So, getting back to the time of the birth of Christ. <clears throat> on the basis of the other two major events happening on biblical holidays, it shouldn't be hard to believe that the birth of Christ would have fallen on a major biblical holiday. There is one major holiday left, which is the Feast of Tabernacles, also known as the Feast of Booths, or Sukkot. Um, as a side note, this is the same day that our upcoming National Meetup Conference is happening this year. Mm -hmm. It just so happens to fall on this major biblical holiday, which this year is the evening of September 29th to the evening of the 30th. Gee willikers, guys, is mm -hmm. that a coinky dink? I think not. So, the scripture and proof I will lay out here will make a scriptural case for why Yeshua could have been born in, on this last major holiday, the Feast of Tabernacles. I use the words could have because this does, does require some assumptions to be made. Mm -hmm. Fair. It can't yeah. be proved with certainty, mm -hmm. but it's my belief, based on scriptural evidence, that the first coming of Christ and possibly also the second coming of Christ occur on this holiday, and this makes sense to me when I look at overall the overall symbolism of this holiday. So, also, just to give credit to whom credit is due, I heard this a long time ago from someone else whose name I don't remember. <laughs> um, there are others who make a different case for Yeshua being born on Passover. That is possible. I'm not saying that this is wrong, but I am making the case here for Yeshua's birth on the other major holiday, the Feast of Tabernacles. So back to Luke 1, let's read some scripture. Mm -hmm. Luke 1, 5, there was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain man named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. Luke 1, 8, so, so it was that while he was serving as priest before God in the order of his division, According to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense, and when he went into the, uh, when he went into the temple of the Lord, these scriptures provide a clue as to what time of the year Zechariah went in to serve in the temple, because all of the priests took turns serving in the temple, and Zechariah served in the division of Abijah. There were twenty-four divisions in Chronicles twenty-four ten. And, and, and in first, I'm sorry, there were 24 divisions, and in First Chronicles 24.10 states that Abijah's division was the 8th division. According to several sources, each division served one week at a time, two times a year, and all the priests served together during the weeks of the major festivals. Some assumptions have to be made here. If the cycle of priestly service starts with the first week of the biblical calendar year, the first month of the year would have been Nisan, or Abib, which means spring. It occurs in March and April, 
on our modern calendar. If Abijah was serving his first week, he would have served around the end of May based on our modern calendar. Mm -hmm. In Luke one twenty three, it says that as soon as Zechariah was finished with his priestly duty, he went home, and the next verse in Luke one twenty four says that his wife Elizabeth conceived. <clears throat> Roll with me here. Let's assume that he got right down to business <laughs> when he got home from his priestly service. Mm. I'm sure he wanted to get his speech back as soon as possible. So, again, let's assume that Elizabeth became pregnant the next month in June, based on our modern calendar. Mm. In Luke 126, we learn that in Elizabeth's sixth month of pregnancy, Mary visited by, is visited by an angel and is told that she will conceive a child by the Holy Spirit. If this happened immediately, it would have been six months after Elizabeth conceived, which would put Mary's conception happening in December, according to our modern calendar. Forty weeks later would have placed the birth around the end of September, which is exactly when the Feast of the Tabernacles occurs. Many of us are already familiar with the scripture from John 1.14, and the word was made flesh and dwelt, or tabernacled among us. The tabernacle was considered a temporary dwelling, like the tents that the Israelites used in the wilderness. And so was Yeshua, as he temporarily came in flesh. And it is for this reason that I believe the scriptures point to his first coming, his birth occurring during the Feast of the Tabernacles. The symbolism makes sense to me. Jews today celebrate the Feast of the Tabernacles by putting up temporary structures and hanging vines with fruit on them. So symbolic of Christ. Wow, what a great comment. And there's, uh, and Linda Eli um, responded to the comment, says, This is so interesting, Mary, as all the spring feasts were fulfilled on the exact day. I have recently been thinking that the fall feasts most likely will as well. So what you're saying makes perfect sense. I can imagine the second coming could very well occur during the feast, this feast as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's a, good, that's a I, good point to be made too. I have a question. And if, if um, Mary um, is visited by the angel. Yep. In Elizabeth's six months of pregnancy. Yeah. When did the episode happen when Mary came to visit Elizabeth and the babies recognized each other in the womb? That timeline doesn't isn't congruent in my brain, mind, place. Um, you mean how long was it before she went and they met up? Yeah. She was pregnant, so that's for sure. Well, Mary. I mean, she's they, probably they, showing. Obviously, they both. Yeah, like <clears> so. <throat> so Ma every six months, he only. So Yeshua would have to be like not three months in the womb, at earliest. So Yeshua would have been in the womb three months while he's about to come out. Yeah, which sounds a little bit like not right to me. Why? Because at three months, you're, you're. It's not. You. Does it say that Yeshua jumps back? It does it. I don't remember. That's don't, what I'm asking. I think. Does anybody know? Let's take a look. Um, let's look at Luke one. I know that John jumps. Luke one forty one forty four. It has greeting. The baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she claimed, "Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear." But why am I so favored that thy mother of my Lord should come to me as soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped with okay. joy. Okay, so it was it was John the Baptist who leaped. was leaping with joy. Yeah. Okay, then it's fine. It totally makes sense. <clears throat> Thank you. Pardon my confusion. Um, all right, then back to the comment. Yeah, that was so much more it was important. only John that leaped. Yeah, yeah, it makes perfect sense. So we're good. So, yeah, we're totally good. So back to the comment. What a great conversation. This is why EBRT is so awesome. Because yeah. we can work these things out. We could. We can talk about it. We in can look real into time. it in real time. We could fix my brain hole. Even though you guys are on that side of the camera, we're totally all having a conversation. We really are. People from all around the world right now. 
are we talking about totally the Bible are. and like really getting their minds wrapped yeah. around it. And it's not the coolest thing ever. It's super cool. Um, so this was a great comment. It's a great and you did a great job writing it out. It was very yeah. interesting, very well written, clear and understandable. Yeah, it was yeah, awesome. It was very well done. Very Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. 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 And it makes sense. And it's great. This is this is exactly why I like to use the word persuaded, guys. At the beginning of the video, I said I'm persuaded that he was born in April. There's a lot of reasons too, though, that I believe he was born in April or that I did. But you make a very good calculation based upon these other things too. So I but even and you said, which is so awesome, you said could be. And yeah. I don't think that there's a problem with any of us using words like could be persuaded. Uh, as I understand right now, like there's these disclaimers of the level of our knowledge, which in a way really makes our conversation. You know, what's amazing. Humble. You know, what's amazing. Am I right? Do, yeah, for sure. And <clears throat> do you guys, I, I suddenly have this like strong feeling of why it makes sense mm. that the Bible doesn't tell us exactly on the day he was born or cause it certainly can. No. Like if you yeah. read the old Testament, why doesn't it's it completely exactly describes on which day and what month you yes. should do what thing and yeah. how, and we're talking about old Testament Moses stuff. Right. It's really ancient. So right. they got it exactly on a date. Why can't we get this one? And, and then I realized, well, wait a minute. Um, this thing that happened with Christmas, mm -hmm. how it used to be a pagan thing, and then it got Christianized. We often, especially those of us who really get into the Bible, look at it and go, ew, that's so gross. It's not really, he wasn't really born that day. It's, it's a pagan holiday. But the actual cool thing that happened is that God has allowed for something that was bad to become Christianized, not in order for it to become like the truth but what it did was it allowed entire cultures to at least get closer to the door if you know what i mean right mm -hmm. so like <clears throat> there's a grace in this so you're saying that in a way god allowed society to have he he kind of i'm putting words here yes he kind of gave like a controlled folly yes i'm exactly. gonna keep this good like blank, like yes. nobody knows for certain. So that way it could be easily incorporated into yes, the pagan exactly. holidays. Exactly. Which in a way, we all know that the Gentiles were the ones that compiled what we call the Bible. It was Gentile money, which ended up becoming the Caesar of the religion, which is we call the Pope. And that, re that religion, that state is what financially defended the bible and kept it safe thank you all these years yes. so while countries rose and fall died and fought you know there that was protected by this pagan technically financial system yeah and and so god was able to allow this to happen and it played a role which is what somebody else said tonight uh that god was using was it dan uh said god was using the the king at the time who said i want to register and god used the non-jew king's register of a non-jewish god ordained register to get them there where they needed to be so yeshua could be born in the place he needed to be born yeah you know what i'm trying to say yeah yeah <clears throat> so yeah you you, you stay what you're saying my point is scripture. yeah my point is that christmas isn't a bad evil mistake christmas is a grace it's a grace yeah i can see that what it what it may have become but when it first started out you know there wasn't a hallmark version of christianity sure right and we, we it <laughs> so doesn't there wasn't a fat man in a yeah, suit running of around course. i'm not saying we stop well, at so. christmas and we say well since god kind of sort of allowed this confusion to be then it must be okay and we'll just stop there i'm not saying we stop there yeah i'm simply saying that you see the god is it. so awesome yes that he you know, this wasn't this wasn't an oversight, and it wasn't information that was lost. When was Yeshua's actual birth? It was on purpose, designed yeah. this way. Yeah. He because he doesn't make any mistakes. Exactly. So we know that if it happened, however it happened, it was the way he wanted it to happen. Yeah, that's a very yeah. good. It's very good, brother. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yep. <laughs> Sarah says, I just love seeing everyone's persuasions here. So much love and so cool different ideas. See, that's how I perceive it, Sarah. I hope, and it seems like from the comments that everybody's posting right now, too, um, that it's like 
this is so cool that we can actually talk about it and nobody's being shot down. Nobody's like, you're wrong. You're an idiot. You're dumb. You're a sinner. It's like, you know, uh, it's, it, this is the, I believe that this is exactly how Christ would have wanted uh, us to be talking about scripture. We're all excited. It's all awesome. Like, it's awesome for us to be excited about the scripture and, and, and hearing the ideas and, and just in case anybody, because you somebody did ask live, they said, "I want to know what the argument is for being born in April." And this is this is this is my. I saw a whole thing about where they rewound the stars in the sky, so the stars move at a certain rate, and they ran a computer um, program that rewound the stars in the sky in history all the way to when the three stars lined up to make. The northern star that the um, that the um, magi followed to find Yeshua. So there was a star they followed, right? That the Bible tells us the northern star, which isn't the northern star. It was a, it was a special star of three stars coming together, and it made a super bright star in the sky. And they rewound the clock of the stars at, at the speed in which they do, and they lined up during that time of April. Now here's the other thing, though. So I do want to say this. When the <clears throat> computer rewound the stars, the star, the three stars didn't stay there for like a day. It was like three weeks or something. So depending on when those, like, the other thing is, is that they had to follow it. It was a journey to him. It wasn't like they got in their car and they like arrived. Like, it wasn't like, I don't know if anybody thinks like there was the star in the sky and then that night they all like got on their camels and were like, let's go, let's follow the star, it's out tonight. And then they all arrived that night. Like, guys, kind of the song or the Christianese commercialized Christianity of, you know, the nativity story and all that makes it seem like that, I think. <clears throat> but that's not the case. It took them a long time. I don't know exactly how long. I've heard different stories that it was like three weeks to get there and it because it stayed in the sky for three weeks. And also it took, I've also heard that it took like three months. Now that's an interesting thing if it took three months, but it still wouldn't be necessarily September, right? Um, I remember hearing, I just looked it, it up. I remember sure hearing there was a comet also that might've been in the sky Yeah, that they were actually going after. And uh, here, this is just a Google search. So take it for what it's worth, you know, um, it would seem that the Magi expected Yeshua to be born shortly after the time of the 5 BC comet appeared, since a comet appearing in the east signified an imminent event. And when they arrived in Jerusalem, they asked Herod, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? So it's possible that there was a comet too, and that's the star. So rewinding back the stars may not be the... Because they would have perceived anything like that, like a comet would look like a star moving. Oh, yeah, and see, Dina says, too, wasn't Yeshua a toddler, though, when the Magi visited? I could be wrong. No, you are not wrong. I do believe he was a toddler. So that is that is the other thing, too. The, it could have arrived, and then they charted the course of where that was, and then they got there, yeah. like, later. So, yeah, because that's the other thing, too, is the Christianized nativity story is they arrived, like, on the almost like the night or week of his birth. Yeah, and I I do think there is a scripture that talks about him being a, like a toddler, and then that gives them the money that they need to go to Egypt to get out of Dodge for the killing right. of the babies. Right. So then he would definitely be more than just a newborn. Mm -hmm. And uh, and Bob Live says they followed the prophecy, possibly Daniel's during Babylonian captivity. Yeah, and the Magi were astrologers, so they were they were a sect set aside of basically like a prophetic their whole purpose was they passed generation after generation they passed on the knowledge of when this star was supposed to arrive so that whenever those magi were alive whenever it came they would know exactly what to do and how to praise him and give him what they needed to give mm. so that's another thing too is it wasn't like just like random dudes who were like Ricardo says yeshua was at least two years old when the wise men and visited him. yeah that's what i heard too Okay, so then, so then, that kind of downplays potentially the April. It does the April version, and then and that does downplay Mary, the April version. Yeah. And so Mary's. Uh, I remember looking at into this years ago, um, and I was pretty, pretty persuaded that it was the uh, Rosh Hashanah, that it was September mm -hmm. when he was born. Um, so, 
Yeah, Ricardo says wise men were Babylonian priests who probably knew about Daniel. Yeah, that that's that's what I understand too, Ricardo. That it was like a sect, though. It was like a traditional. What's the word I'm looking for? It's like a a sect, right? Like a, a group, a sect. small group a sect. Yeah. Sorry, is my pronunciation? I sound like I'm saying sex or something. No. So, <clears throat> so that it was a small group of men, or that were it was the knowledge was made sure to be passed a on. Cult. Yeah. I, honestly, yeah, like a yeah. cult. Really, you're right. That's that's more like what I want to say. Yeah, interesting, right? Yeah. Um. Yeah, yeah. So in Luke, when Jesus was born and the shepherds come to see him, he is called the babe in Matthew. When the wise men come to see him, they called him the young child. The two Greek words use a different point in the fact that Jesus was or Yeshua was aged. Uh, slightly between the shepherd's visit and the wise men's visit. In Luke 2.16, the words used for babe when the shepherds come in is uh, briefos, meaning newborn child or infant. And in Matthew 2.16, the word used for young child when the wise men come is uh, pedion, meaning little boy, little girl, young child. See? This is the, this is why this is such a great, like... Teamwork makes yeah. the dream work. This is great. Hmm. Okay, my persuasion has changed today. Mm hmm I don't think he was born in April anymore. I'm right. I'm with you on the tents. I think it makes more sense. I mean, you did the math, though, too, Mary. You did such a great job. You, like, did the math. So from the event to when the conception could have happened, then I do think he probably got right to work, as you said. <laughs> I think he was like, I want to talk again. Yeah. And also, I think he'd probably be a little worried that maybe if he didn't get right to work, something bad was going to happen yeah. again, right? So, uh, if a miracle, if a kind of like a negative miracle, if you will, call it that. I don't want to call it a curse, but like a negative kind of miraculous thing happened to you. You probably also have a nice, healthy dose of the fear of God in you at the moment. So. Oh, yeah. Uh, Cameron also says, I was pretty convinced of an astrological argument for Yeshua's birth, putting it in September of 3 BC. Mm. I forget the exact day, but I think it was Sukkot. Yeah. Mm. All oh, right. So not Rosh Hashanah. I meant Sukkot. Right. The Feast of the Tabernacle. Mm. Um, Diane, you said, did did you men go to school for Bible study? Just wondering. Uh, this isn't like us teaching, just so because it seems like it might be new. Diane, these two guys you're watching, we're not teaching the Bible. Uh, it's actually a thing where everybody reads this chunk of scripture, and then everybody comes and they do like a week worth of research and studying of the original text and so forth, and then we all come and we read the comments that everybody leaves on a graphic on our main page live. So it's not, we're not teachers of the Bible. We're just uh, facilitators of the video in which you're watching and it's everybody, including yourself. So next week, if you wanna join us, we hope that you will. So this is just a group conversation. That's a really good question. So thank you for asking that. Um, Vicky says, God is so organized and plans everything perfectly to the T, no mistakes. Yeah, that's I mean, right. Mm -hmm. I am persuaded that that's the case. Um, <laughs> and people are done with this series they're gonna hate that word with i'm passion. persuaded okay i am persuaded you yeah. get to read ricardo oh i comment. do okay let's do yes this. all right here we go luke 2 7 through 20 uh ricardo says yeshua laid in a manger and an angel coming to shepherds sent and send them to witness messiah's birth did some research and apparently the manger where yeshua was placed at birth was Med megdal eder the tower of the flock located near Bethlehem, a designated place for the unblemished lambs intended for continuous sacrifices mentioned in Numbers 28.3, where sacrifices were performed twice daily at the first hour and the last hour of the day. In the base of this tower, food for the flock was placed. Apparently, this is the same place where Rachel died while giving birth to Benjamin. Beyond this place, uh, Migdal, Eder, Jacob set up his tent after Rachel's death, Genesis 35. Micah 4 8 prophesies the Messiah as the tower of the flock with these two words in Hebrew, Migdal Edar. And Micah 5 1 prophesies the Messiah's birth in Bethlehem. If this is true, the significance of the Messiah being born in the place reserved for unblemished lambs is noteworthy, as he is the Messiah, the unblemished lamb. It seems the shepherds who received the announcement from the angels were likely either Levites uh, or shepherds specifically entrusted with the care of this flock, unblemished lambs. 
likely responsible for their inspection and sent to inspect the birth of the Messiah. If this was indeed the case, it would explain why the angel's instructions to go to the manger in Bethlehem, a rather vague instruction that could indicate any place, was clear to the shepherds of the flock as they knew exactly where they had to go. In addition to all of this, the significance of this place is further enhanced by the fact that this is where Benjamin was born, which means son of the right hand, a name given to him by his father Jacob. However, in reality, this mother named him Ben Anoy, which means son of my sorrow, prophesying that the first coming of the Messiah would be a suffering servant, a son of sorrow, where now Yeshua is his second coming sits at the right hand of the father the right hand okay real quick before i forget this is really interesting too in christianese as i like to call it right in the in kind of the christian commercialized telling many a times the story of the wise men and the sh and the shepherds are on the same night and many people do say that the shepherds also would have fallen the st followed the star to the manger and in the cartoons and movies, there's a light literally shining from the star in the sky onto the manger. Mm. But the Bible never says that that's the case. Right. It's just the poeticness that's used. So this is also why Christianese is, it teaches that the shepherds and the magi arrived on the same night at the same time, right? But now we see that the shepherds would have arrived to the manger because it was a significant symbolic manger that they didn't need additional instruction so that also doesn't put the star on the night of his birth correct do you see my point yes and then the magi come two years later when it's time for them to bring what they need to bring to him so that they can have their exodus that's right you see my point yes now it all makes a lot more sense if you take the christianese out of it see this is why it's funny because you were talking about christmas and while I understand why they chose to make Christmas at the Council of Nicaea and do what they did, it's what it became with all this kind of lore and Yule tides and all that and, and right. Yule language and, and the Yule religion that got into it that kind of muddied the water a lot sure. more and made Absolutely. it worse. So this is th and this is a perfect example. These this kind of cartooned storytelling has totally deceived actually and made more of the bible confusing when in all reality as we're reading through it it's really not that confusing as we're no. breaking it down it's quite Absolutely. clear this is a, this is awesome so thank you guys Absolutely. for your hard work so you see dan i didn't it wasn't what we said we're reading the comments and the, and the people like yourself are doing the work so welcome and join us please it's awesome she says i love luke by the way 923 is my favorite oh awesome well we're gonna get there soon yep hallelujah um uh i we second what, what what sarah says yeah when we get to chapter nine we'd love to hear you you, you know even say why it's your favorite yeah you testify about 923 we yeah. want to know it's not just knowledge by the way so if you are a new person watching this video uh like dan it's not about just coming and spew, spewing kind of research or knowledge uh also testimonies like if a passage that we're reading tonight is your favorite like if you tell us why like what does it speak to you why is it you know move in your heart also if a passage even bothers you like there's a passage that's hard for you to understand or a passage that like maybe even kind of gives you a little bit of like it rubs you the wrong way i guess is the vernacular i'll use like we want to hear that too so that we can talk that out as well so uh it's not just a knowledge uh series that we do here it's just kind of literally people from all around the world using the internet to have a cool conversation about the Bible. That's right. It's really cool. Yep. So anyways. Um, and then Linda Eli um, says, Love this. So fitting that those who tend the, tended the Passover lambs would be the first to see the Lamb of God who would give his life for us. I mean, this conversation to me is like bringing so much more depth to the whole Lamb of God thing. Yeah. Like and it the was shepherds. The fact that he was born in the place where the perfect lamb are born yeah. for the temple sacrifice and when they were sacrificed he, and during the time of sacrifice the other thing is is i think it's so awesome if you could imagine you're serving in the temple and this is second temple period yeah so so there's kind of a again a christianese lie about the second temple period because there's only one miracle during the second temple period right 
No. Hanukkah. Yeah. Because if these are the Levitical priests that sacrificed the lamb, and the guy who saw and the woman who saw Yeshua, and he was the ash tender in his season, the, the, the dad, John the Baptist guy, right? Yeah. So my point is to say is that when the whole, because it says the Holy Spirit fell upon them and they would recognize. Right. And the angel of the Lord showed up to these shepherds. The Levitical priest shepherds who shepherd the for the flawless lambs to be sacrificed. So you're saying you're saying these are <clears throat> also miracles of the second temple period. If we read this in the Old Testament and it was Samuel or Ezekiel and then an angel came to them, it would absolutely be categorized as a miracle. So Yeshua's birth and Yeshua entered the temple and the spirit moved and, and they recognized. So when Yeshua entered the temple, there was another miracle. And at Yeshua's birth, the Levitical priest got witness to another miracle. Other than Mary's miracle birth, I'm saying. Like the fact that they got visited by angels. And they got the Holy Ghost because it says the spirit of the Holy Ghost was on them. So I'm just saying that like that diminishes, like really diminish. Like when we say those sentences, yeah, we're diminishing the actual blessing and the miraculousness of what happened during this time period. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's true. A lot of these sort of... Um conclusions these these little or phrases this, these fra one yeah. sentence phrase that's supposed to encapsulate hundreds and thousands of years of biblical story yeah uh can be very deceptive because they kind of get into our head and what is we always evaluate information so we we will always go to like yeah the second temple was diminished because the first temple had this stuff and the second temple only had one miracle we, we've talked about this a lot in the series, too, how we felt about that. Mm -hmm. um, but you're bringing up a really good point, which is, you know, in general, we're so dismissive of things. Like, have you ever really seen this part and received it as like the miraculousness that it is? It's uh, Christians kind of read this and glaze just kind of like, oh yeah, the miracle of you know the oh the angels talk to the shepherds, yeah, okay, that yeah, happened. like everybody everybody wants to see the Elijah miracle, the fire out of the, you know, eyes and mouth, yeah, and, the, and yeah, or the or 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 the Ark of the Covenant, or you know, behind the veil, the golden light, all this stuff, or the mountain being burned and the lightning and the yeah. voice of God, like like we want to see up and the snake, yeah, yeah, but like when we think about. These sorts of miracles, including, you know, Mary's immaculate birth, we kind of, we, you're, you're right, we kind of just kind of go like, okay. It's like, oh, that's cool. But in reality, how big of a deal is that? <laughs> it's a huge deal. And and so real quick, scroll up because there was a comment I want to read real quick. Just one, it's a swaddle. Because I know we, we did say it, but I do want to double highlight it, Dina, because I'm right there with you. No, you passed it. Okay. She says, um, she says, um, and the fact that, it is mentioned in the fact that it is mentioned that he was in swaddle that detail could have easily uh been overlooked or not mentioned left out that he was swaddled yeah yeah that he was in the swaddle and then the reason why they swaddled the, the lambs and that absolutely i know that that they would do that today they would wrap them and they have probably put some type of bubble wrap on it something to protect them from scratching themselves or messing themselves up uh, because what they do with babies. Well, they I know. Today. Was it somebody who shared a video, or I just I stumbled across the video, and they do say that they put um like socks mm -hmm. on their hooves so they don't not not just on oh, babies yeah, yeah. so they scratch themselves. But I'm saying they do that for the lambs, where they will put the socks on their hooves so that they don't also scratch themselves or hmm. do something like that as well. So my point is to say too is like so so now let's take a look at the second temple. The first temple brings in the blessings of God. I'm just so soapboxing here for a moment, right? The first temple brings in the blessings of God's atonement so that the sins that men just cannot stop doing can make God still bless the people. Can allow God. Yeah, yeah to allow God. And it gets so bad that God's just like, done with yeah, it. Yeah, like this is, not, this is not fixing anything. Yeah. Second temple is known as having no miracles other than Hanukkah. The festival of lights right the hanukkah situation with uh that that whole deal with the candles not running out of fire but then you think okay but wait it was the building of the second temple that brought in the actual lamb so was 
was the second temple truly though more humble in its appearance that's the and other thing though more humble in its appearance and daily sort of routine and no miraculousness bring the greater miracle and the greater that, blessing that was my point yeah so in actuality because don't we do we not also kind of get told that the second temple was kind of just like Meh. show yeah, yeah it was like just show, like man it was just whatever right but then if you actually think about it it was the second temple that brought in the real lamb that would atone this time not for the the earthly blessings for god's blessings to come in the earth to be balanced so that, but wow, for the salvation amazing because for the longest time the impression we've had is that the second temple guys got to toil build a temple and kind of went 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 for, for hundreds of years for yeah them. and like their blessing was to get out of babylon and get their own land and be under the thumb of whether it's the babylonian kings or the persian kings or the greek kings or the roman kings so our thought about the second temple has always been like, well, it was kind of like really not so great. And probably the people weren't so great. Maybe that's why the miracle didn't move. When in essence, the greatest miracle of all, it was humbled. Mm -hmm. It was humble and humble and humble. And the greatest miracle of all was actually brought then. Mm -hmm. Not during the first temple when it was all bedazzled and yeah, filled gold with it and animals golden on the lights steps and, and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Yeah really interesting isn't that interesting that's really interesting so but this conversation has like made me realize that tonight. yeah that's like because really the way we're talking about it and pointing that's it really out good. like now i have a whole new appreciation so, for the second so temple. the guys and girls the the israelites who went through all of the difficulties and all of that stuff remember that whole thing where they're like we got to put the they, they had to divorce all of their gentile women because they were yes they, it was like not okay yeah and they had to go through all of this like difficult stuff to first even get to build this temple right, right this temple didn't go up because of the richness of uh david or israel or or solomon the temple went up like out of why it was just what do you because they got back to the bible right they got back to the bible well they got back to the scripture yeah they got right back and to he's the like scripture. hey we got this thing yeah and we're allowed to rebuild this yeah. let's make sure this time we actually do this right yeah but they did it based on the word written rather than a spoken of God. Yeah. This time it wasn't respoken. It, I mean, he said, you're going to be allowed to go do it. And the non-Jewish king is going to be the one who allows you to do it, right? Yeah. So that's the other weird thing. And the reason why this is weird, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. There's something called the fulfillment of the Gentile in Here? the future. Well, in the future, right? Yeah. There's a, something that the, the Jews know, they call it the, the fulfillment of the Gentiles in the Bible, but we'll get to it. But my point is to say this, was it also not the fulfillment of the Gentile because it was the money and the power and the protection of the Gentile king that allowed the building of the second temple, which was more humble than when the Jews financed it themselves and, and did the glory. because the temple, wow. And then because the Gentile brought it in, the fulfillment of salvation of the Messiah, the Lamb of God came in. And the prophecy now is, is that it will be the Gentiles who finance the third temple. And then that will re-educate the Jews about why Yeshua is the Messiah. So real quick, I just is that kind of crazy? The, the, the humility of the second temple is what they actually had a hard time accepting. Exactly. Which is what drove all the sects. They got the whole Sadducees thing going. There's all this lack of belief suddenly because they didn't have this constant magic building that would do things. Yeah, there wasn't um and therm happening yeah, during a day. There wasn't. That. Yeah, so they so even the priesthood was humbled. Like yeah. everything was humbled. It became very political due to this humbling that they couldn't hang out with it very well. And when Yeshua shows up and calls it the temple of my father, and gets all upset with them, I'm sure half of them are going like. It doesn't seem like that to us right yeah, now, like, does it? We've been doing this for a hundred years, selling pigeons here. Like we don't feel the yeah. we don't feel the thing. And I think Yeshua's point is, if you read the scripture, that should be enough for you exactly. to know it is the thing. Okay, I'm, I'm 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 we're bouncing off each other here. I love this. Yeah. I'm I'm thank God I'm looking at. I'm like, are we like just having our own world right now? <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're totally watching us. Yeah. But listen, listen. So this is amazing, right? In your in your understanding, and I agree with you. Yeshua is like, what are you talking? Like, why are you be treating the? Why are you treating the temple? So this is to the the, the priesthood because we know 
because of what we already read in the first two gospels, right? We know that he's super pissed off with how they're treating the temple. Yeah. Like that's the thing where he gets mad and like yeah. attacks them. Yeah. And threatens them. Yeah. He's threatening them all the time, right? Right, right. So the thing is, is like, why does Yeshua threaten them? We totally talked about this in past videos. He threatens them because they're using the temple now as not a way for them to get the blessing, but as a way to block them from blessing. And yeah. they're using themselves as these liaisons to God and then making themselves better than the normal person and then making it so they can't they can't get right. But because the atonement doesn't even seem to be of a concern for them, you're and what you're saying is they're like Yeshua is saying, well, you if you read the scriptures and you know what this temple is and you know that it was by God's appointment through the Gentile king and the Gentile kingdom that allowed this modest, humble temple to be built, right? Then you would know that this is God's temple just the same. You shouldn't be treating it any different right. because there's less gold and rubies and all the stuff, right? Wow, and, and which so, goes back to... Oof. Right, which ties in with what they were doing. They're trying to... It also, it, it also actually, it also, um, uh, it also has the theme of um, loving the poor and the downtrodden and the widows because... Who pays attention to all of those people? Nobody wants to. Everybody's like, oh, you know, everybody pays attention to the rich and powerful and the glitzy and the beautiful and everybody who's got all that stuff going on. Yeah. They get all the attention. Everybody yeah. wants that. Yes. But when you see the poor and the and the and the diseased and the and the homeless and the and the widows and all of that, that's like ooh, that's a that's a drag for people, right? Yeah. And so and and the Jews did have a belief, like if you were misfortunate. You must be like hated by God, or yeah, mad you must be despised for a reason. Like you, you must have this awful life because you deserve it, or something. Right. And 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 um, it's a common thing. It's not a biblical thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a common thing. But my point is, Other like culture. Yeah, and, and it, it probably exists in all cultures. It's not. It's not a thing. For sure, with the Jews, though. Yeah. Well, I mean, at the time, they also say those kinds of things. But... Click see more. Sorry, I'm not trying to interrupt you. Just click see more so I can see what she wrote. Okay. Um, so yeah. <laughs> so Mary says, and so, um, she writes, and so we circle back around to the original comment from Dan that God works in all people and in all things to bring about his will. So placed the Jews right smack in the middle of the Roman world in order to bring about the Messiah to reach the Gentiles through them. Like, okay, so Mary, I'm, I'm, I know we're like chasing a soapbox here, but this is actually pretty great conversation because you're right. When it was the Jewish Hebrew kingdom, the Israel kingdom as it was in its original state, it was just atoning for the blessing of earthly matter, right? Matters, right? But when it was wrapped in the Gentile kingdom, it was when the Messiah was birthed. Like, and it was when the Messiah came. And then the other thing that I think is also fascinating is, remember, the Holy of Holies was so holy, they had to tie a rope around him and put bells on the high priest because if they prayed wrong, <laughs> they died. And nobody could go in and get him. So they could pull him out with the rope, right? And then what does Yeshua do? Or what happens when Yeshua dies? The moment he dies, the veil gets ripped. So it's like the second temple was there in a way to usher in the true lamb of god which would break the temple like yeah. that you see us like the humble temple the non-beautiful temple ends up being the one that births the messiah wrapped in the gentile culture and then the veil gets ripped and then it's destroyed in a war from a false messiah on the exact same day as the first temple was destroyed what are the odds of that? Yeah. So everything about the temple, the second time, you can't say that the like God's hand wasn't actually on it. And and I I know we went on a super big long conversation to circle back to this, but what I'm saying is that I have a whole new respect for the second for the temple. second temple because I feel yeah. like in actuality, though there wasn't Uma and Therma. That there wasn't maybe a gold mist in the holy. And you holy know what's rooms. great is we're having this conversation <clears throat> on the scriptures where Yeshua, the baby, yeah, is brought to the second temple, to the temple 
Exactly. That's my point. And that's where he is, you know, sanctified according to Mosaic law, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And that's where he's recognized by the two prophets. In the temple. In they the temple. Him. Yeah. And so like, so like, yeah, you're right. We have this because of how the story goes with the New Testament. Everybody has, and everybody has kind of a thing about the second temple, like, eh, it's just a building that wasn't really... Didn't do like, anything. Oh, Yeshua's going to, you know... Right? Yeah, like, we, we all have this lack of reverence for the second temple. Yeah. And I love this conversation, too, because it's making us realize that our lack of reverence for the second temple is because of its... It's because it's humble. Yeah. We're not recognizing its glorious nature, that it's actually more glorious than the first temple. Mm -hmm. It is a greater blessing certainly is a greater blessing upon all of us who live now uh, and 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 a greater blessing upon the gentiles who now get to participate in it in the blessing of the lord yeah so and that's yeah and lamar you're making a point that i was going to get to as well which is really important lamar says live the veil was ripped was significant because it meant we now have access to the elohim the father through yeshua and that's the thing is only one person had access to him in the first temple it kind of feels like nobody had real access to God in the second temple because there wasn't the miracles, as they say, were happening, right? The Uman yeah. Thurman wasn't working. I wasn't doing anything, right? And then you have you, the real Lamb of God, the manifestation of God in flesh, comes, gets into this temple. So, what, what, And here's the thing that Yeshua says, too. He says, you guys swear by the temple when you make your oaths. But is it not the, the God that makes it great, not the temple is great? And so, okay, take it, Yeshua's own words here. He says, it's not the building that's special. You keep swearing on the stones. You keep, he says, you even swear by the showbread and the lamps and the chairs. He's yeah. like, you swear by these materialistic things instead of swearing by the God. You say, you, the one who blesses it and is what yeah. makes it holy, right? And then here comes the God in human form into the temple the being they've been waiting for all of history to come and undo what was done all the way in the garden here he is two people in the temple recognize he is who he is speaks that he's god in flesh in the temple so the prophet is speaking onto the child saying this is messiah this is god in flesh right it's like I, I'm I almost I'm I'm now a little bit persuaded the second temple was more glorious than the first. I think that's the point of this it whole is, because God was discussion. there. Yeah, because the God was there more. In all reality, God was more in the second temple because as our brother Lamar just said, the veil was ripped so we could all have access to him, which is exactly what Yeshua says too. I must die so that I can go to the Father and send the helper. I will come and be in you. The Holy Ghost, the Ruach HaKodesh will live in you after I go to the Father. And if you think about the temple, remember when we did remember when we did the tabernacle? How the tabernacle was the imprint of the body, the kidneys and the heart and how you entered in and all that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so now the second temple gets destroyed, the veil is ripped, and now we are all have the ability to have direct relationship with God. Yeshua's body gets ripped, it dies, it breaks. He goes to the Father, and now we all have relationship with. And then he says, "You're this. Your 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 body now is the temple." I mean, I know we know all this, but like tying it in in this conversation, technically, what happens at the second temple is way more blessed than what happened in the first temple. And and then and I I'm, I am gonna skip ahead just because I I have to for my own thought here, the fact that the third temple. I believe will be largely financed by Gentiles and it will be televised all around the world. So now, now the, the, the Gentile world, not just a Gentile culture or city wraps around the temple. Now it will be, and the Bible calls the temple actually in the, in the, in the old Testament, you guys, the Bible calls the temple, the temple of the world. Do you remember that? It doesn't, yeah. it does. He doesn't call it the temple of, the Israel. Jews. Yeah. He says, he says, this is the temple to the world because all people are allowed to come and make atonement and ties and participate. They have to assi assimilate into the culture, right? But it is the temple of, which is why the outer court exists. We talked about that in the last scripture. The outer court was for the non-Jews to come 
and begin their relationship with him. Yeah. And they wouldn't even allow, they couldn't do it because the outer court was being used for the tradings. So, right. so sorry for my rant here, but, but I'm like totally mind blowing here that like the third temple will be wrapped by the entire world. It literally will become the center of the world. It will be a whole world event for all nations. And then what you have is you have, I believe, the bringing back of Yeshua from the teaching of the Christians or the behooving of the Christians who will help finance it and help put it there politically. And then that will be the, that will be the, uh, of the Gentile fulfillment, the of fulfillment the Gentile. of the Gentile. It's like, I don't know. This is okay. That's my rant. That's I'm just, this is a fascinating, your guys's work has allowed me to be super pumped about the it, second you temple. Think like, about, I've never been pumped. Before. So if you, <clears throat> oh, well, I don't want to go off on a tangent because I know we got a lot we of comments. Did. I know we have so many comments. My bad. But what you just, what you, you just, so awesome. what you just touched upon, mm -hmm. you know how we talk about how <laughs> I don't know if you guys, this isn't, this isn't meant to be derogatory, but every once in a while I've heard a funny term called the frozen chosen, where in relation talking about the congregants that go to church and sit there every Sunday, um, and they we don't necessarily we we haven't necessarily observed in them this great moving of the spirit, and we ask ourselves do they really are they really experiencing the lord to the level that an apostle might have or anything close and we've always come to the conclusion they must not be but if you think about the fact that it is the church congregants who are possibly going to finance the third temple mm -hmm. if you're talking about people who will be interested in putting a building on earth like for for us who get to read the Bible in this fellowship for Nathan, who has experienced the Lord the way he has for me, who I have experienced certain things the way I have for all of you out there who have experienced things the way you have, maybe in your heart, the way Yeshua has promised, or maybe in a physical experience, the way Yeshua has promised here in the scriptures for you, the idea of a building may not be so exciting. You may be like, I don't need a building. Yeah. I can pray to God today. Like I can talk to him right now. Like what, what do we need a building for? But for those who don't have that experience at all, mm. and instead all they do is go to church and give tithings and do all that stuff, they are a necessity if the temple is going to be built. Yes, exactly. And they're the ones that are going to want the temple there because they're going to hope that if I can make a pilgrimage to this temple, maybe I'll actually feel the things I hear my, my pastor talk about in church. Mm -hmm. So you talking about it like this, about the third temple like this, has sparked that suddenly, sparked that vision for me you know, I don't know if it's true or whatever, but uh, it sparked the vision for me that, yeah, like it makes sense why Christians would go in droves mm -hmm. and why this would become the temple of the world. Mm -hmm. And it also makes sense why the Jews would want it that way, because Israel is not exactly in a position of power today, even right. It's mm -hmm. really the, Israel is surrounded by a lot of hostility. Mm hmm and they don't do too many things to want to end that hostility, <laughs> end that hostility. on their own <laughs> yeah because they want to stand up and have their land it's their land they just want it mm -hmm. and there's whatever it's biblical they want it it's okay but point is that um they still to this day require the gentile kingdoms of the world yeah. to support them very much yeah and they can't really do anything crazy without the support of the Gentile kingdoms, which is why they're always interested in making treaties and having peace accords. And they're always interested in being friends with the superpowers, both of them, mm -hmm. every one of them. Mm -hmm. So for a nation like that, who knows that there's only like 16 million or whatever, 20 million of us, 13 million, whatever it is. And there's billions of people in the world. He says us because he's a Jew. Yes, <laughs> us meaning Jews. Yeah. There's not so many of us. And it's happened in the past that things have gotten really bad for the Jews. Right. Um, it would make sense for the Jews to be inclusive in the idea of the third temple for it. And they would want it to become the temple of the world. They wouldn't necessarily care if the people who come to the temple truly understand what it is or truly do all the things they're supposed to do. They're going to have their court, so to speak. They'll tell you right now they don't care. They don't. If you go to the museum that's financing it and building it, they will tell you they don't care what the Gentiles or what anybody thinks. They just want to build it, and then the, they're going to do what they're going to do. Yeah. If they, if, and, and they'll give tours and stuff to the Gentile or yes. the Goyim. But, you know, other than that, though, they're like, whatever. You can believe. You can do whatever you yeah. want. Take pictures. Here's like, a donation box. Yeah, here's if a donation box. you feel box. closer to God by visiting us, yeah. thank God. Yeah, you know, and that's good for God. That's yeah. amazing. God's doing miracles, but, yeah. like, it's not, you're not, we're not. You're not involved in what we're, we're actually not, doing yeah. here. If you want to be involved with us, well, then here's Become the like yeshiva. Yeah. 
grow the Pesach, snip the tip, and do all the things. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but no, and and I know we're off on a huge tangent here, guys. But I'm I'm having a totally different. I'm I would say that I have a whole new light in my head, in my mind, in my understanding of for sure the Second Temple, and I feel. Like, if you take a look at how the Second Temple served in such a more actual, miraculous way, birthing the manifestation of God on, uh, on earth, birthing thereby our salvation atonement, the real Lamb of God, and the details in which he made sure to put that all in, from the swaddle to the location of his of manger and all that, right? Now you, you start to, I start to look personally in my mind at the Third Temple and what it ushers in is the second coming of the Messiah in his full glory. So is the third temple thereby not more glorious than the first and second? And just to bring home what I was feeling to say, which Sorry. is that, no, 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 this is good, which I was feeling to say, which is that we can't sit here in crazy judgment of the quote-unquote frozen chosen either. Because if they're there to purely finance the third temple, let's just say, which is an which is a part of the prophecy and will of God. Mm -hmm. um, they are not doing a wrong; they're doing a right. And if it's if, if they're, they're playing the role that God they're playing made them the role, play. and if if it, if their fulfillment is in that act of mm -hmm. contributing to the creation of the temple, maybe even doing a pilgrimage to the temple, and maybe mm -hmm. even just going there to do a tour, mm -hmm. right? That is also. <laughs> Not something we should look down upon because we have been blessed right. to experience God in a in a way maybe a little bit more intense or you know we it's a blessing upon us it's not it's not a rubber stamp of approval or any of that stuff it's it's just we we should thank the Lord that we've been blessed that we've been given an experience of let's just say this EBRT which has been amazing for all of us I know we've been tremendously blessed by God but it does not diminish the fact that the fulfillment of the Gentiles does include even those Gentiles that sometimes we think to ourselves are, you know, missing the mark or something. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. But and 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 for me to 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 kind of summarize like to the to, to my point of the end here for me is this, you guys. It, what Alex is saying is so so beautiful to me. Because have you ever and whatever denomination you're in, right? Have you ever, or you you relate to, let's say that, you, you identify with or you relate to, have you ever said, how can I look across the way at my brothers of another, and sisters of another denomination or other kind of, part, the way they participate or interact with the Lord or think about the, the Lord, how can I stand in unity with them and rejoice in the fact that they're different or they do things differently? And does the Bible not say, who is the hand to say to the foot, you know, I do not need you, right? And we talk a lot about this on Yeshua Network because I am personally very passionate about unity of the body of Christ, breaking down the denominational walls. We do the hashtag be the light, which is in two days, by the way. Hashtag be the light every month for the last five years or something like crazy like that. And so my point is to say is that if we really look at the fact that what does the temple do, the third temple do, it think about how many people are going to believe in the Bible because a building is built in Jerusalem. Think about how many people are going to, to participate regardless of denomination. They're all going to come together and make donations onto the Lord, by the way. So even if you don't think that there should be a temple because Yeshua has fulfilled the purpose of the temple, that's not actually completely 100% true because if the temple's built, there's some legal things that can actually bless Yeshua's name and kind of help the Jews receive him. That's a whole other thing we talked about in the past. But if everybody comes together, they're all making donations, they're all going in pilgrims, like, pilgrimage like my brother is saying, it's the denominational walls are torn down by the unity of the building of the temple of God. Exactly. And in actuality, by that behavior, the temple does indeed fulfill its name as the Jerusalem temple is actually the temple of the world. And it's like, this, this is why, like where my brain was going, but like this whole conversation has really helped me like feel, I feel yeah. so different about it. Now it's like, now I'm excited about the temple being built because this desire in my heart that I've had for since I became a Christian, which is like, I hate the denominational walls. 
I, I feel that it's of the those denominational walls are of the devil and they keep us griping and fighting and bickering with each other and not unified as Christ said. And Paul says a prophecy in the Bible where he says, when we will all be acting as the one body we're supposed to be, we will see greater miracles. I'm going on a tangent here and I'm 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 just I'm just saying. We know that in the end times, there is more outpouring of the Holy Spirit miraculously than at any time in human history. And if you think about if the temple being built tears down the denominational walls in that for finally, Christians around the world can actually agree on one thing, or at least a majority of them can agree on one thing, that the fact that the temple being built, whether you agree with its purpose or not, it glorifies God because people will actually believe in the Bible, seeing such a very clear and distinct prophecy coming true thousands of years later. So the increase of faith would also even match with a um, prophecy that there's going to be a great revival. I have always wondered what the great revival will look like and why it will come. And I'm now under a possible persuasion that the building of the temple and the unity of the body of Christ around the temple was b being built could actually be finally the world will be like oh so this is what it looks like when christians of all types and jews finally agree on something work towards the same goal edify in all of our actions the bible is truth the bible prophecy is being fulfilled in our lives we'll see it with our eyes and we'll even be able to go and touch it with our hands that's a mind-blowing concept right there. And what outpour will come from that? It's it's prophesied there's going to be one, right? If do, you, do you see what I'm trying yeah. to say? Yeah, and if you think about the vast majority of people who visit the Vatican today yeah. are not visiting out of a spiritual need to connect with God. The vast, uh, forgive me if that's... A lot of it's you, art. Forgive me if you, that's blasphemous yeah. to you, but I, I feel that probably a large, if not vast, majority of people who visit the Vatican do it because of its historical awesomeness. Yeah. And it's gorgeous and all that stuff. Seeing the Pope or anything like that is, is icing on the cake of a tourist. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So if suddenly there's a temple in Jerusalem that now is attracting the same level of tourist interest does it not glorify god exactly and and if, and unite the body yeah and 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 as as people as christians who are seeking a, a more a connection to the holy land because of where christ walked and where he was crucified and all that stuff um now there's going to be probably a greater infrastructure to receive more people i mean i'm we're just we're just this is all mundane stuff. We're, we're, this is all normal stuff. This is not miracle-y stuff. This is just mm -hmm. stuff about... But for whatever reason, if giant numbers of people go to the Jerusalem temple, exactly. is it not glorious? Exactly. And will it not bring us all closer together by virtue of all being there? Like, it doesn't matter if you're a Calvinist or Catholic or a Schmidt. It won't matter anymore. You're there to visit yeah. the one temple right. that who built the Jews. And why is it important? Well, they're kind of the original guy. Like nobody will be able to deny the fact they did it. Right. The original dudes, excuse me, the original culture yeah. who is biblical, yeah. they did it. They pulled it off. They got the temple built. Yeah. Like there's just by these very like, you know, just it's sort of, no, the words I'm looking for is like normal every day. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Like it's, it's. You're saying the Jews, the normal everyday Jews? I'm just saying like just by people doing their, without anybody experiencing a crazy oh, surge. Supernatural. Of supernatural fire. spiritual fire. Yes, exactly. Um, we, we. So, yes. This is the point. Yeah. So it's the second temple was humble and simple and it seemed as though it had no magic to it. Yeah. But in reality. The beauty of the second temple actually performed the greatest miracle of all. God manifested in flesh, died, resurrected. That was during his season. The veil ripped so that we could all actually interact with God. So in all reality, this unseemingly majestic, magical temple yeah. 
is super crazy anointed. And, and now, here you have yeah. the second modernized temple, yeah. which may not have a whole bunch of miracles happening in it once again. Yes. Right? But it It'll will be, be performing the greater miracle, which is it will be uniting the body of Christ. And bringing billions and, of people, potentially, and, millions and millions of people to it. Uh, exactly. The yeah. pilgrimage in Jerusalem is going to be out of control. So, so that we know that much. And we know it's not going to happen. Nobody's going to look at the temple and think to themselves, it's a miracle it exists, unless they understand the Bible and they think about it deeply. Well, the prophecy that it yeah, exists. Yeah, the prophecy is a that it sure. exists. And then if they think deeply about, wait, these people have been around for thousands of years. They've been messed around with it. They're still around and they're yeah. still doing the same stuff Moses taught them. And they got their country back as well. Okay. You, yeah. So if you're a Jew or if you at least have an, an understanding of the history of the Jews, you might see the miracle in it. Yeah. But in general, though, as a building, it's going to have architectural plans. It's going to have normal construction companies. Right. It's going to have all the things. Screws and bolts. Or screws whatever. and bolts and all the things that a normal office building in America or anywhere in the world has. Yeah. So nothing about it is going to feel magical and a miracle that it exists. Mm -hmm. But the function it will perform will be even greater. Of a miracle, yeah. Of a miracle. It will be even greater in power yeah. than than the prior temples. And I wanted to say one thing before we jump off of this, even though we spent a lot of time on it, but I, according to the comments coming in, it seems like most people watching right now live are enjoying this rant we're doing. Yeah. But I'm excited. So I hope this everybody understands this of excitement. But I do want to say this too. I, th I think it's also so brilliantly designed. Yeshua says to the woman at the whale, well, you you do not know the God you worship, for it is for the Jews to know. They know who God is. It is for them to know who the real God is. You do not know the God you worship, right? So now think about this. The reason why Jews don't believe in Yeshua as Messiah is because of the sugar-coated paganism wrapped around the relation the, the religion of what Yeshua is, right? That's they will say, well. The Christmas, the three, the Trinity, the all they'll say these are the reasons why we know he's not the Messiah. It's all the Christian-y stuff. Okay, now why is that important in the third temple? Because no Christian is in charge of the what's happening. No Christian is in charge of what's being said. No Christian is in charge of the rituals. They're gonna go back to the original scripture. They're going to do what God wrote and said to Moses, and they're gonna redo it the way that the God said to do it. And then that way, all the bickering that Christians would be doing is going to be annihilated. It doesn't, Christians won't even be able to argue. Right. It's like me and you sitting there going, yeah, but the temple should have this, that thing and this thing. It's like, dude, you don't know. Yeah. You're not the Jews. And if God allows this, this temple to be built, as we said earlier in the video tonight, if, God, if it happened, it happened the exact way God wanted it to happen. We know the temple is being built. We know it will be built without the outer court, which is another very interesting thing because the outer court was where the Gentile would come to make atonement. Now there is no outer court because it is lived on or it is obtained by the Gentile. So the Temple Mount is shared now with Gentile in the outer court and the Jew has the inner court and there's no wall now. And now all the Jews are in control. Gentiles cannot fight. Christians cannot bicker. It's literally like it, it has to be the Jews once again, my brothers and sisters, who have to build the third temple. It has to be them that control it. It has to be them because otherwise Christians could never agree on anything and it would not work, right? And we all worship a God. And technically, we do indeed as Gentiles, like the whole Christian sugarcoat thing. I don't mean to be degrading. I'm just saying there is a religion that is man-made around the truth of Yeshua and the Bible that's not in the Bible and this is what causes the Jews to not believe and all that is going to be peeled away and there will be real I believe I'm hoping there will be a real search for who Yeshua really is when the temple's built and of course it will be the Jews who lead it Do you, I, that's it's just so I, I, I'm with you me, I'm dude. with you 100 percent because there's the there's the um there's a certain there's a certain humility in Judaism that you can't get around. Which exactly. Is, which is like, uh, totally it doesn't agree. matter how you feel. Yeah. It doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter any of those things. We have the law, mm -hmm. and this is how it goes. Mm -hmm. And if you want to be right with God, here's the list of what you have to do. 
And it's kind of like something that no Gentile wants to have anything to do with, myself included, by the way. Not that I don't want to have anything to do with it, but it's just, it's like, it's an imposition upon my life that is so intense, I can't, it's hard for me to picture, <laughs> right? We're so used to the way we live, yet we receive God, yet we have relationship with God. We're mm -hmm. spoiled. Yeah. And the Jew looks at us and says, you're, whatever you are having a relationship with, maybe it is indeed God, God bless you, but it is not for me to allow myself to think this way right if i am to have a relationship with god he told me precisely what that looks like exactly and that's going back to what you said yeshua said the jews know the god they worship yeah you do not exactly so by the jews given sort of like by when the temple goes up it's as if god just stamped the earth yeah. and said here I allow these people yet again to build the thing that holds my name. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and that and that is going to be something that's going to send a shockwave of like humility upon us Christians. We're just going to have to say that's that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Christians have no say in whatsoever. Yeah. Christians are going to be so humbled. Yeah. Oh, you guys have a relationship with God. But where's where's God and like where where is God anointing you with his temple? Yeah. Oh, we all have churches exactly you yeah. have more churches than there's starbucks in the world right right like it's just like come on guys so that you're making my you're, you're reedifying you're saying it so well yeah. the the other thing is too on this point right i'm so pumped right now because i absolutely am falling in love with this third temple like and the second i'm like in love with the temples right now because i understand <laughs> god's hand on them right now like yeah. i really feel like i'm having such a wonderful insight to the revelation of the temples were it was never a show building yeah. It absolutely was a building where it needed for uh, there needed to be a prophet and a prophetess to say over Yeshua and Mary, this is God, this is the mother, this is the situation, this has happened. It had to happen on the temple. He put his name there. And also it says that on the eighth day when he got circumcised, which would happen in Jerusalem, that was when he got his name. So God put his name there. Yeshua is God's name with a glorified statement. He's manifestation. He's the word, God's word, name, manifested in flesh at the temple where God put his name. There's there's nothing not beautiful and romantic about the second temple to me right now. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? Okay, third temple, I know we're kind of going around about here, but like to not let any of the things slip through the cracks in my mind, right? Somebody asked live, they said, so uh, I think it was David. He said, now live, he's like, he said, now question, is everybody participating to get the third temple built? Is that going to be also why it ushers in the Antichrist? Because everybody's going to feel they have their fingers in, right? The answer is absolutely yes. The Bible tells us that. In fact, it is the Antichrist who formulates and signs and puts into motion. You, you ready for this? The contract that allows the temple to be built. Did you ever think about the fact that this event that's going to unify Christianity with Jews is going to be done by the Antichrist? And the Bible says that the world will love the Antichrist. The Antichrist isn't this person with, with evil red eyes and a pitchfork and a tail like a devil. They're beautiful. They're wonderful. They start off as this person who's trying to make everybody happy and give the world everything they want, right? This is the Antichrist. So it's crazy to think that the Antichrist pins the third temple being able to be built. So now this thing that has unified Christianity and Judaism, in a weird way, the world will thank the Antichrist for it. And then, I know crazy thought, right? And then there comes a great falling away later and the abomination of desolation and the temple, the temple will be desecrated. The Holy Spirit will be, will, will leave. So as the veil was ripped and the second temple was destroyed, we know the third temple is going to have its physical issues and desecration by the Antichrist when he goes in and says that his law is higher than the law of God. And he's not a Jew and he's, he's a Gentile and he stands in the Holy Holies then that gets desecrated, which is the abomination of desolation. And that, that is the event that causes like the ushering in of the second coming of God, of Yeshua. Like, like, you know, so is, the great kind of yeah, crazy, this is starting to make, you know, this is, this is a, this is a, uh, we're, we're, 
we're way way ahead of ourselves today but it's flowing so let's go i um, i have to because i'll i feel like i'll i want to come back to this video yeah. when we get there so i can why it's yeah. fresh you know it's it's very uh much painting a picture i can be persuaded by obviously it hasn't happened yet i'm not claiming we know anything other than it's it's making sense um that the second uh, excuse me the third temple will also coincide with a great swelling of spirit and a great uplifting for humanity for yeah. all of us yeah whether you are whether you are even if you're buddhist or wiccan or whatever it'll be an interesting event and um and then for believers it'll be a really a big event and so as that grows and maybe the maybe the the spread of uh hey god's really a thing and man he's really on the planet in this temple or maybe that travels far and wide and there's your revival mm -hmm. and if the bad guy mm -hmm. shows up and stands in it and says hey by the way don't you all know this is just the building yeah i helped it get built what am i special like are you telling me i i did this not god god didn't do this building i did it right. is what he'll say yeah. potentially and he'll or say my law is left. greater than god's law. and therefore you say i could have i could have not made this happen at all exactly so let's all calm down here with your superstitions people yeah. and uh boom and from that that'll be for all the people who obviously don't have a root in the bible like we've been blessed with um they're going to be like, oh, well, I guess that was nothing. And there's your and, great falling and, away. And then the magic of it is gone. Yeah. Yeah. And then you have a falling away. And just like the 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 Jews may have treated the second temple of like, well, we're still under the yoke of the Rome. Mm -hmm. We're still, we're, we're less free now than we were when we built this thing. Yeah. So I guess uh, that was nothing. They allowed themselves in their hearts, perhaps to some degree, say that the temple is nothing more than our heritage, our culture, exactly. our myths, our hopes and dreams, but it's not really God with us. And if they don't have the miracles happening like the first temple, they might be like, maybe that story is fairy tale or it is, which is what the Sadducees said. Yes. The Sadducees said it was just a story for, for us to get a compass. It didn't actually, not all the miraculous happened. That was just like yeah. a story so that we would get the, the, the lesson, right? This so is if why the, the third, Bible is so important. I know, it's so important. It's so, so important because it is actually our only tool for faith and it is meant to be our only tool for faith. That's such an important statement because, and that is why I, I, I mean, my, you guys know the, literally the foundational sentence God gave me for my ministry was John eight thirty two. you shall know the truth and it shall make you free. Like that sentence has so much importance, especially when the temple's built, especially when the antichrist goes in, especially when the world is losing faith. And also we know that it's three and a half years from the time of the abomination and desolation that Christ returns. And those last three and a half years are the worst right so it but and and I'm, I'm not just saying this theoretically right maybe somebody's watching this would be crazy if somebody's watching these videos during those three and a half year period well wow. right wow. and they're like wow these guys said that way before this temple got built and wow. then and they're saying it's in the bible that's kind of a cool idea hi yeah. anybody in the future if you're watching this <laughs> so real quick though if 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 you think about it this way right if you are somebody who's read the Bible, when the abomination of desolation happens, when the temple's built, the body comes together, Christians and Jews come together, they do this whole thing. They, I believe there's going to be so much zeal. I'm. This is just as Nathan speaking here. I believe there's going to be so much zeal on planet Earth when the temple's built from Christian and Jews alike, and there's going to be such a a, a wave of of. Uh, of uh, people coming to the faith let's call it right mm -hmm. that the world is going to be like they're going to literally think we're arrogant the people who don't like it they're going to be like you're arrogant you're pompous and then the antichrist comes in and he puts the kibosh on all of it in a single day and then all those people who are on the sideline going it's fake it's barbaric you're sacrificing animals pete is going to be pissed 
like all this stuff you guys are delusional you might as well be the mayan sacrificing virgins off the top of a pyramid because that's all this is it's a temple you're sacrificing animals you're atoning to a god they're going to say that doesn't exist and then when the antichrist goes in creates the abomination of desolation and then all the falling away happens because everybody it loses its lack lackluster right and the yeah. fall and and it loses all that what was beautiful about it is gone let's just say right yeah, yeah yeah and then all the haters are going to be like told you so yeah and all the people are going to be like man you did tell us so so does that make you the new prophets right right because what they prophesied was is that it's baloney yeah and then god doesn't quote unquote protect the temple in fact he kind of leaves the temple the bible tells us this, this and then is, causes everybody to fall this away is, this is the perfect this is the way this right? is the, exactly how god's been operating if you check your own personal life and you've had experiences where he's here and then you feel he's not and the da, da, da and you're earnestly clutching and wanting something and then he feels further away from you and then when you're humble and you're down he comes at you like a wave of just here I am yeah and when you when you when you have faith when you're humbly seeking you receive but when you Anyway, my, arrogantly seeking, yeah, you, my, you get like humbled. Exactly. Hold on, let me let me finish my sentence though, yeah, real yeah. quick. This is the that's the point I want to make. If you know the Bible at this time, mm -hmm. you're not gonna fall away. No. Because every bad thing that's happening was also prophesied in the Bible. Yeah. So as everything gets worse, your faith is actually gonna be like drying cement. Exactly. You're getting a harder, stronger faith exactly. because they're gonna speed up. Exactly. It goes like this, like the even if you read Revelations, my brothers and sisters, it's like this kind of bell curve to it, right? It's just like e, and then at the end, just like it's like okay, there's a, this this thing happens, this thing happens, this thing, ha and then as you get closer to the end, it's just like, and then there was plague, 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 earthquake, earthquake, fire, fire, people, plague, die, disease, the war, go about famine, ch -ch -ch. and it's just like at the end, it's all happening at once, and it's just like everything is going nuts and every time something happens you're going to be in your bible that day or that week or that month and you're going to be like this is out of control level yeah. of prophecy being fulfilled your yeah. faith is going to be so strong yeah and i don't know who i'm speaking to but i know i'm speaking to my past self when i'm about to say i have actually wondered i'm like i um if it's got to be yes the holy spirit that's going to be the increase it's the holy spirit that's going to secure me in the end times when god if i'm willing if i'm alive if i'm watching all this go down and the bible says that man will seek for death and will not be able to find it and i'm like i do not like that sentence now i, do I don't like believe it, Sam, I, I do not believe that he's talking about believers who are in faith i'm th i'm I'm very persuaded that that, and because of the whole thing, not because I wanted to, but that is talking about how bad the world will get for the non-believer. I do believe that believers, real believers who stay true to the faith will actually be able to keep their faith and keep their joy. And I believe that the miraculous and, and will still be happening for believers who stay with it. And I do believe that if you think about this now, if the spirit, it gets pulled back, you're going to be looking at a 2,000-year-old Bible. I hope you have printed Bibles, by the way. Everybody should be getting massive amounts of printed Bibles because these, these may get turned off or batteries may not work in that time. Just saying. And what, what I'm saying is, is you're looking at your Bible and you're just watching prophecy after prophecy after prophecy every day happen, happen, happen. How can you not be like, it may not be having fun right now, but there's zero doubt in my mind because of the truth of God and the written word of God, I cannot look out the window watching one talent pound hailstones fall and not be like, that was literally on page uh, Revelation uh, 1621. One talent weight pound hailstone balls falling at the end in times, right? And you're telling me you're not gonna look out your window seeing that happening and not being like my faith is through the roof right now i know yeah. do, you, do you see my point it Absolutely. won't be miracles it won't Absolutely. be people walking on water this it will is, be the word of god wow. that will be the increase of our faith at the so, end times so besides this fabulous conversation i know today, i'm sorry no, massive no, 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 rant no. massive besides rant. this massive side side rant and conversation yes. today one of the benefits for me of this conversation today is once again maybe even on a deeper level realizing that this ebrt is so important yeah 
because you guys we are experiencing really truly i can now kind of see the analogy to the roots uh having deep roots and having a strong foundation because um there will there there will come a time where nothing in the world is going to make you feel like it's all going to turn out well mm. there will come a time where everything is dumped on in terms of faith and and only the bible will be the thing that will let you still have your faith only the bible only, yes and it's all we're already there though that's kind of the point it's been the point even in the second temple period yeah christ shows up and says hey guys did you not read the scriptures you are telling everyone about yeah and if you did read those scriptures why are you treating the temple as if it's not the thing that it says it is in the scriptures it turns out that even then the story was the same your scriptures were the truth and people who did not when people did not adhere to them mm -hmm. is when they lost faith yeah bob says live it's easy to think we will be going to be tough and loyal but it will be a totally it will be a different story when our comfort zones are crumbling okay I'm so glad you said that because I know when I, I was talking about the end times and we're looking out the window and the stones are falling and we've got our Bible, we're like, oh, it's true, we believe. But I will say this, I, and I do want to give this testimony. I gave this testimony off of EBRT, but I want to add it here to EBRT. In the dark, very dark season I went through in 2023, this year, super dark season with my brother and my family situation and all that, right? There, God had not been speaking to me for like five years, just on and off little tidbits. But for a guy who is like hearing from him all the time my whole life, just tidbits here and there it was basically like devastating to my soul. And if you know me and you've been around, you know that that was what I was like going through a very difficult time because I didn't have that constant communication and pre and, and, and just interaction with God. So it was a, it was a valley. It was a dry season for me. That was horrible. And the thing that kept me, the only thing that kept me alive, literally, physically, actually alive, and I mean like that, that, that my heart was beating still, was the fact that I knew scripture. It was not a wooey wooey feeling. It was not that, it wasn't that I had even hope for the future. I, I want, I, I'm going to take a second to take to say this testimony. I did not have hope for my future. I did not think tomorrow was going to be a better day. The only reason I'm still alive was because I heard the word of God and I have seen the word of God coming true in my life already. And I couldn't denounce, I couldn't convince myself. I couldn't convince myself the Bible wasn't real. Because if I could have convinced myself the Bible wasn't real, then I could have done a very stupid thing. I could have done a very big mistake. And then I would be like not worried about it. But because I couldn't convince myself the Bible wasn't real because the Bible had proven itself to be true. I lived to tell another day. I lived to see another day and had done another day and another day. And I got through the valley of the shadow of death and the Lord then began to speak to me again and communicate with me again. You guys know that testimony if you saw the video. And now it's like the Lord's back with me and I'm, I have a relationship with him. He's talking to me again and all this stuff. And it's like, it's like I got my breath back, but it wasn't that breath. It wasn't the supernatural. It wasn't that God speaks to me. It wasn't that like, you know, all the, all the miraculous wasn't what got me through the valley of the shadow of death. It was the word and the word alone of God. It was the word and the word alone because the the there was lack of all the other stuff. And 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 so and I I do I am totally persuaded confident in my persuasion as well that this was for me to have this testimony for the end time people who might be watching this during the 3 years. I do confess and i do want to say that i believe that if you do just know if you just know the word of god and you do just see the fulfillment of prophecy your faith will stay and i do believe that what we do here on ebrt and at yeshua network with the focus on the entire bible being written in our minds and written in our hearts i do believe that it will be the thing that make us free when all other minds on earth are bound to depression 
and doom and gloom and that they will seek death and will not find it. And I do believe that we will have the lamp oil. Thank you, Thomas. The lamp oil will be the word of God. It will be the, the, the and I, I know I'm not trying to take away anything romantically from the power of God and the Holy Spirit, but I do believe that, you know, the word of God can sustain you through the end of the world. Amen. So <laughs> when we started, when we started the EBRT, I remember marveling literally on the first video. Whoa, guys, it's 2018. We're on the internet. We're reading the Bible. Mm -hmm. Feels like a miracle. Fast forward to today. Um, the 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 what we are experiencing doing reading now is literally our salvation yes so because as my brother is explaining if he had not had the bible and the bible only mm -hmm. you he had a, has had all of his experiences that wasn't enough mm -mm. he's had uh, all of his ups and all of the other things he's that wasn't enough mm -mm when 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 you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death as mm -hmm. described in psalms if you don't have god's word with you it is very tempting to stop walking through that valley yeah because the valley of the shadow of death means there is no hope there is no there, life. Is, there no is no life no... Yes. after the valley yes, all brother. you see is the end of everything yes you look back and you see that you were at a peak and you look at yourself now and you see that you've tumbled into a dark valley yeah. and you look all around and you see ginormous mountains you do not have the strength to climb. There's nothing left but to crawl under some rock and die in the valley of the shadow of death. Mm -hmm. And the only thing, mm. the only thing that could possibly keep you from doing that is the word of God, the entire word of God, because you know from having read it that this is how it goes this is how it's meant to be exactly this isn't wrong yeah it's not broken god didn't lose yeah he's not he's not defeated you, yeah exactly the overcoming will come it doesn't matter how and it doesn't matter when and it doesn't matter why mm -hmm. and it doesn't even matter you just know and it's not something that gives you hope in the valley it just gives you truth and knowledge. I had no hope. No, hope. I had no hope whatsoever. You guys, I was still waking up every day. I was still answering emails. I was still doing ministry. I was still coming on. I'd still smile. I'd still put on my face. I'd still say the word of God is true. I'd still say everybody read the Bible. I did 40 day holiness challenge during my dark season. Think about that too. Right? So, and, and, and so that was a moment where he spoke to me. Actually, I don't want to take away that from God. So thank you God for that. But the, but but the the word of god the truth of god is it was the only thing that was just like i can't denounce this as true like i'm i know we're repeating i'm just like yeah. it's so and i'm seeing the, the comments you guys are getting it but like this is i've tonight's conversation i'm just gonna say i i'm i'm totally okay with the soapbox i'm doing tonight because my brothers and sisters i don't know about you but i needed it i needed tonight's video I needed the comments you guys researched and did. Like, it's. It, I'm a little bit like, I don't want to think about it, but I'm going to say this sentence. For those of you who participated in this video and you wrote your comments out, it would scare me if you did not write your comments. If we didn't have every one of the comments that you guys wrote, I do not believe this conversation would be going the way it's going. And that scares me because I needed this night. I needed these words from God. That spoke not just through me. It wasn't like through a prophet. It wasn't through Alex. It wasn't like, boom, here's the spirit of God floating above his head as a fiery tongue. And Alex gave us his truth. It was your comments. It was my comment. It was his comment. And we've come together as a body of Christ. And I don't know about you, but I have been fed tonight in a way. I've never been fed. And I say that because I've never had the slightest little inkling of how faith may be sustained in the end time. I've never had it. And tonight I'm like, I know exactly how faith I believe is going to be sustained in the end time. And somebody wrote it. 
though heaven and earth shall fall away, my world, my word will never, never fall away. It will never be gone, right? The written word of God, the spoken word of God, the manifestation of existence, everything, God's word will never fade away, will never go away. And all I know now, and I can say that I've tested it in my own soul in existence, I can stand on the word of God alone and I can get through the valley of the shadow of death. I can get through death. What does it say? Dina, I love your comment. I needed it too, Nate. God is awesome. I'm on holidays and get to join live. Mm. Would have missed this wonderful conversation if EBRT had not been delayed by two weeks. This has happened to us over and over, over and, and over, over again. again. Yeah. It's all in God's timing. It is. And and you guys, my, my brother, it made me think back earlier to the beginning of our conversation today where my brother's saying your comments are making this whole thing possible yes. tonight. It is, it is, God is working in a symphony here at EBRT too. It yes. is not one voice. It is not two voices. No. It is all of our voices. He will give one guy this and one girl that and one girl this and this and that. And then boom, 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 boom. All of a sudden there's a full picture that shows up. Yeah. And, and, and back to the temple idea. The idea that maybe the frozen chosen are going to be the ones who've been frozen in temples, excuse me, churches forever, tithing, that are going to help build this temple. My point is that too is a symphony. It Those is. two are instruments of the Lord. Yeah. So like the whole thing, even the revelations and the poopages and all the stuff, the scary things that we read about, that too is part of the symphony. It's so beautiful. We, could, I like that you say symphony because right now in this conversation, I, 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 there's times, and you guys have known, there's times where I think about, let's call them the frozen chosen, right? Or, or the, or the, what's the other one? The, the, uh, prosperity churches, the pros like, oh, come believe in Christ and you're going to be rich. Right. Those are the ones that might donate the most money. I'm just saying. Yeah. So now it's like, if I see them as a hand and I'm a foot. If I see them as a hand and I'm a foot and their participation in helping get the temple built, whether I agree with them, whether their walk, whether, whether I think somebody's walk is right with God or not, that's irrelevant for me. I'm only responsible for my own walk. Exactly. And I'm only responsible for reading the word of God myself. Exactly. And I'm only responsible for how I testify and how I do the Lord's will, right? That's the only thing I'm responsible for. And if I'm doing the Lord's will, it's the Lord himself who's going to domino the outpour of truth, life, and love, and salvation on people. Yeah? because So, so if everybody else in the world is doing wrong, like the prophets of the Old Testament, everybody else in the world is doing wrong. But if there's one person who's willing, who's willing to do right and listen, right? God can use that person to bring everything back to correctly. And I'm not trying to say myself. I'm just saying that that's everybody's story. That's Alex's story. That's your story, David, Sarah, Monica, Ricardo, Vicky. All, this is everybody's story is that you, if you choose to, be that person who says, I see everything is going wrong, but I'm only going to be concerned today with what I read, with how I study, with how I get in the word, with how I get in relationship with God, how I surrender to God. If we all do that, then we'll all be in perfect alignment and everything will stop going wrong. Well, I mean, that's kind of... <laughs> well, well, okay. So, but, but then why everybody else is broken? But here's the thing is I'm no longer looking at the frozen chosen and I'm no longer looking at the prosperity teachers, uh, preachers and, and churches with an ick in my heart. Right, 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 right. Just That's because the of the perspective that we've have today yeah. in this conversation, yeah. nothing has changed in the world, you guys. Nothing. They're still gonna wake up tomorrow, and they're still gonna be frozen, chosen, most likely. They're still gonna be. They're going not the individual. I'm saying that there will be somewhere on the earth there will be frozen, chosen. There will be prosperity preaching, right? There will be false doctrine and teachings and heresies being taught around the world. It will be there till the end of time. That's not gonna change. But now my heart for them is different because of the conversation my brother has given us and you guys have given us, which is like, I'm like, yeah, but they're playing a role. Exactly. And I always, I have struggled. I'm just gonna confess tonight, I've struggled. Like, Lord, what, how many of you heard me say it on video? Lord, what do I do? What do you want me to do with Yeshua Network to combat prosperity preaching? What do you want me to do to combat frozen chosen 
false doctrine, false denominations and religions and, and, and paganism incorporated, right? What do you want me to do? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> I don't want you to do anything because I'm not making a mistake. Exactly. I'm God and it's not broken. Exactly. I just want you to do you. what I put on your heart for you to do. The Bible even says, do not worry about tomorrow. Just do what the day is for the day. Like just take what the day is got possible to do and just do it. Right. So it's like, like now it's easy for me to be unified. I'm so happy to hear this. Praise the Lord. Vicky right. says 100% unity. I can be totally unified with somebody who's a frozen chosen or false stock. I can be unified in the sense that I can look at them and not judge their soul to damnation, but I can look at them and go, whatever you're going through and wherever you're at and however you're walking, whether it's right or whether it's wrong, it's not outside of the will of God. And he's going to use you as he used the Babylonian king, he's going to use you, any of us, to bring forth his will to the fulfillment of the entire story of earth and existence. And I can be like, thank you. I can literally like, thank you that you're playing that role. And, and humbly, I can turn to God and say, if I am Lord in line with you, if I am in the truth, if I am serving you as you have commanded me through scripture to serve you, if I am, I'm not better. I'm, I, I know like the word, but I'm, I'm lucky. Like I'm blessed. Like why, if, if, if I, Nathan Wheeler, if, if Alex Lavosky, if we can say, Lord, if I am serving you as you, as you will, as this is in, if this is right with you, we are so blessed. We're, we're, the, we're the luckier ones. We, we, we aren't better. We're, 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 it's an, it's, what's the word I'm, you humbling. know, it's humbling. It's humbling. It's not an arrogant. You're going to be humbled by it and you're going to be like, why me? Not, yeah. not yes, me. You're going to be like, why me? Exactly. So anyways, this is, this is such a big day for me. Super crazy rant based off of what you guys wrote. And I, I can't believe that in tonight's video, I wasn't expecting it. I'm so glad we pray what we pray yeah. before every video because it totally happened this video. It did. Again. Yep. But I'm so tonight I have a, an insanely new respect for the second temple, an insanely new respect for the third temple, a new appreciation for the fact that if the second temple wasn't what it was and in the way that it was, we wouldn't have Messiah. That's a crazy thought. Never. It's so simple. It's in scripture. I've read it a thousand times. Why am I just tonight having it? Because we did what God said. We had a fellowship. And we talk together about the Bible. And when we do that, he anoints it, right? And it's like, I, 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 and then now this whole thing with how I can feel love for any brother and sister, even if they're doing something I don't agree with. I can be like, look, I'm not worried about you. I don't need to be worried about you. Because no matter what you're doing, God can work it out with you. But most of all, I know he's going to use it. And if I know that God's going to use the... I know that God is going to use the Antichrist himself to bring forth probably one of the most unifying denominational wall breaking moments in human history. If he's going to use the Antichrist for one of the most glorious Christ unifying moments, I don't have to worry about nothing. <laughs> Am I right? Yeah, I, I, I agree 100%. This is a mind blowing night. What, what the Lord what the lord communicates to you and calls you to is all you have to worry about it, it's not even a worry it just happens right yeah and then all the other things we do about spinning when we spin on all the other things we can't possibly control and we begin to doubt that god's got those things covered or we begin to think that somehow god wants something for someone and and they are somehow out of his like we I know. Just, we just, we just, we just, we go as if we know. Yeah. And we don't know. We have no clue. We have no clue. Like none of this works without all of it working the way it's working. So even with the ugly. Yes. The ugly is you, absolutely there for a reason. If you took the ugly out, the blessings won't fully come as they're meant to yeah. come or be understood we, as they're supposed to be. We're understood. clumsy. Even. Yeah, absolutely. We're clumsy. We get that. 
intellectually, mm-hmm. we're still clumsy at sure. even describing it because the level of complexity of all of the variables exactly. that happen in creation mm-hmm. is so intensely incomprehensible by our brain. The vast numbers of it all. Mm-hmm. It's like to imagine a super duper quadruple super quantum duper computer times 55 botrillion. Like yeah. it, it's that level of complication. Like God knows every piece of data in creation, every yeah. piece. He knows exactly where everything goes. He's planned exactly every littlest of moves. You know what I'm saying, guys? Yeah. Like this is a level. So and then and then we show up, we see a couple things here and there, we get excited, and we think we know enough to call judgment. Sarah Peterson live, right? Like the wheat and the tares. Can't rip up the tares now without taking the wheat out too. God knows what he's doing. Okay, and does this passage also not speak to you a little bit differently after tonight's video? Check check this out. Ready for this one? Oh no. What? Where'd it go? Come back and give me back, Lord. It was a good one. Hold on, hold on. It totally is a whole new meaning to me, this passage. Hold on. It's uh where were you talking hold on? Something about the wheat and the tares. No, you need the It tar- ties in that, but no, it's not that one. Were you, you were talking about just now. The millions of pieces of data, the bazillions data. We 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 we, oh, man, we see a I couple things it. we think we uh, it's oh uh, anyways it's i'm gonna uh, lord please get back to me it's so good is one passage in the bible has a whole new meaning to me like it, it wraps up everything we we're talking about tonight it was very short too man what was it but yes sarah the wheat and the tares you can't you can't rip it up because you'll rip out both right yeah the harvest is in the end time one of the temples is a weed one of the temples is a weed no i don't think so you the data to Alex. I have you as data to Alex. Yeah, exactly, right? Yeah. The coding in you. Oh man, it was such a good scripture. What was it, Lord? Come on. Oh. Anyways. All right. Listen. Uh hi, I'm late, but happy and blessed to be here. Happy and blessed to have you, Susan. Thank you. Um we we did definitely go take a, a rocket ship town, on a tangent yes. today. We don't normally do this. If you're new to the series. And this is not normal. This is, well, not like this. Yeah, not no, to this we, degree. <laughs> we really, we really, we really just allowed ourselves to take mm-hmm. the brakes off of this car. Yeah, and I'm so glad we did. Me too. Um, I, I, I personally needed this. Too. Yeah, and I think it's awesome, you guys, and we're so blessed that you're here with us, going on this ride together. Um, we will get back to Luke two, probably next week right is that what i'm feeling is happening yeah yeah so bob sorry go ahead bob says time has to continue until the individual is saved exactly stand by for nathan video when it pops back in his head that's probably true david it's on the verge it was it's really good i want to know now. i know i want i i really want to share it was really there's one passage that that like really it's like putting the cherry on the cake of the tonight's conversation i like cakes I eat too many cakes. This is obvious. We, to, hold on. we were by my girlish figure. Oh, I got it. After tonight's conversation, does this passage speak a little bit differently to you? Pray for those who persecute you. Pray for your enemies. Pray for those in power. If you realize the Antichrist ushers in the temple which will be one of the most unifying Christ faith building moments. If you pray for them and they don't receive, they don't change, they don't re-receive, they don't, they don't, they don't, if they don't, if the person you pray for who's evil, let's say that, if you pray for the evil people, they're not outside of the will of God. They may not be doing the will of God, but they're not outside of the sovereignty of God. I'll say that. They're not outside for the sovereignty of God. I feel like now I don't have to be so mad at evil people because I know, wow, I know that there's no evil on earth and there's no evil person on earth that's going to derail God's will. Now, I could have said that sentence at any time in my life, but it wouldn't have hit home as much as it hits home right now for me. 
because of the application of understanding that in the end times, I was worried that I was going to have so much hate for all the horrible evil people are going to be doing. But when I realized that while that hate and while that evil and why that while that torment of humanity and children and the whole gamut is happening, I can be angry about it. But I can also know that God has already rectified and justified in the end it's it, there's not going to be a an eye tear that's not dried that is meant to be dried like like the the understanding that god god's victory is already written is very different for me tonight because and it's so weird by understanding the importance of the second temple which could have totally seemed like a like mistakes upon mistakes yeah. upon misfortune upon loss yeah but it was so not it wasn't it was exactly what it needed to be if i can have the appreciation of the second temple that i have right now which i would have never even understood was even possible because i'm like yeah but it was it was just there for like show kind of it was yeah. like ritual right yeah. not at all not right. at all anymore in my heart is that what it was so now i can understand that anybody who is also doing evil and ugliness and bad in the end times is actually, unfortunately for them, but for those of us who are in God, they're actually bringing forth the fulfillment of God's word, proving to me with every evil they do, and every they're forcing the hand of God more and more and more, and therefore, I'm seeing God's word coming true. And then in a weird, sadistic kind of, I don't know if this is going to be good for anybody who's a new believer, but in a weird way, I can almost kind of say, thank you. Some you play that are... role. Yeah, some vessels are for destruction and some are for glory. And I can say, thank you. That person is playing that role that that will usher in and force my father's hand to come and destroy this world, re-terraform it, bring messiah back and be king for a thousand years and and like it's it's like i'm not mad at you i pity you yeah i understand that what you're doing you don't have a you don't have you it's and i've always understood this but it's the light bulb went on tonight. yeah yeah and i and i don't know i'm hoping that everybody it, else it, you understood this. it intellectually but tonight you have a piece about it you didn't have before in my soul it's like yeah. it's like my soul understands yeah yeah. And it's so crazy to me that having an understanding about the value of the second temple yeah. has birthed this like revelation. It was like that thing that we spoke about tonight yeah. in your work that you guys have done in the, in, in understanding that the place where Yeshua was wrapped in a cloth and birthed was where this, the lambs were sacrificed. Where the sacrificial lambs were birthed. We're, we're, sorry, that's why yeah, I meant, yeah. yeah. Where the sacrificial lambs were birthed. I'm like, none of it has just, it was, it's just, I, it's it, no it, longer it, just a manger on yeah, a farmer's exactly. farm. Exactly. It puts, it puts the temple right in there as, like, it, it sanctifies the temple. Yeshua's birth in the machinery yes. of the temple sanctifies this temple. Do you see the detail? How much yeah. it totally changes the word yeah. of God? Yeah. Like, so now how can I not think, and I mean, now I'm looking at how, how the Antichrist is going to help build the third temple, which will help bring faith and unify believers. Like what looks ugly in the grand view of God's will is not ugly because in the end, God wins. Right. And if he wins, which we know he does because I see the word of God, I read the word of God, and I see the word of God coming true, that means I can trust the promise of the word of God. And the promise of the word of God is that I'm going to be with him for all eternity. I'm going to reside with him. I'm going to be able to lay my crowns at his feet, and he's going to be blessing me with his light forevermore. If I can trust what I'm seeing in the horribleness of the world, I can trust that the promises that come with the re-terraforming of the word world with Christ coming back is also true. And it doesn't, it's not as hard for me to believe the good promises if I can see the bad promises coming true. Right, too. Am right. I making a little yes, sense here? Yeah, yeah. The, the, if the prophecy of the 
of the difficulties if the prophecy of the tribulations comes true yeah it means that the prophecies of salvation are true too yeah so like there is no bad news here no so if the prop because we all know there's there's what <laughs> what do they say there's three certainties uh today i was having a conversation with a co-worker god bless him today there's three certainties in life right death taxes and god right. god's love for you for yeah. us well, i like that um he's a believer so that's why he has number three usually people just say death and taxes, taxes. so if we say death and taxes are a certainty mm -hmm. um it doesn't really matter tribulations or not everybody winds up in the same spot mm -hmm. so if god prophesied tribulations to the letter and in them promised total salvation um the tribulations coming are good news they're a relief from death actually because if 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 the bible isn't true then there's just death and taxes guys yeah there is no god loves you right there's just death and taxes right. so whoop de doo of course we know that's not the case no. we know god we is, do we know that that's not the case we know the bible is 100 percent true and we know god is 100 percent real and loves us but to all those poor souls who don't know that yet or mm -hmm. may not know that for a while or yeah ricardo you said it very well it's like seeing satan automatically approves uh, automatically proves god yes How, if i saw satan manifested would that not mean if satan is there that means god is there yes yeah and so that that is what i'm saying and like seeing the babylonian situation birthing the second temple the lack of miracles in the in the in the temple but yet the greatest of miracle being in the temple and then like the destruction of the second temple and the way it was destroyed and then like like there was not none of it is not clearly the bad part the fact that the temple was destroyed in 70 AD by the Roman Empire on the exact same day as the first one was destroyed that's a horrible day, right? It's the saddest day in all of the Jewish culture, faith, whatever, right? In the world, it's the yeah. saddest day, right? Yeah. Okay, the second temple is destroyed. Bam, first. On the same day. On the same day. Yet at the exact same time, it glorifies God because it proves his prophecy. He put it on the same day so he so everybody would know it wasn't outside of his hand. It wasn't outside of his sovereignty so like even the ugly is proving god so yeah you said it so well ricardo it's like seeing satan automatically proves god and like i think that that i think that's probably maybe a good note unless you got something i think it's a good note to end on because for me it's like i ha i can pray for my enemies i can pray for the people who i really have disdain for right now because i understand that whatever it is they're doing and whatever evil this world is going to perpetuate and promote, not that I don't speak against it or stand against it, but why would I pray for them? Because I understand that they're being used to bring forth the will of my Father God. My Abba Father God is actually, they're actually bringing that forth. And it's like, man, you don't know the role you're playing. I'm not as mad at you. I have like a crazy sympathy for you or empathy. They know not what they do. They know not what they do. Exactly. So you guys, I thank you for this. In your heart, you can understand Yeshua's statement, not from a place of, oh my God, he's so loving, but from a place of, he told the truth. Yeah. They literally do not know what they do. They literally do not know. And they are not, you can't, you, you, you cannot hate a fly for being a fly. You cannot hate a squirrel for pooping on your lawn right you you it's just what they do it's what they do um and so man right there's a there's a peace and truth it's there's just... a true peace and truth i have to confess i've been a lot less perturbed by um you know sinful evil doers things not because I approve or discount or look upon what they do with a sense of like it's okay quite right. the opposite it's yeah. definitely not okay yeah but i'm completely i i'm finding myself i don't want to say completely i'm finding myself much more i, I care less about getting passionately upset at them now because i just 
I've, I've accepted that this is this is part of this, God's creation. This is part of the story. This is part of the story. If it wasn't that particular person, it would be another just like him. Exactly. And so this is just what happens here. This is like, this is part of the part of the uh, landscape, mm -hmm. and uh, the landscape is perfect and beautiful, and all the ugliness in the landscape is part of its perfection and beauty. So, you know, one more thing too, and not and this can almost go a little bit dark, but it's the truth. Every evil that we have to suffer is also a treasure for us in heaven. Every persecution we have to endure is another treasure that we store up in heaven. And like, it's not about the treasure, but the idea that like, that's what I mean by how God has already issued justice. He's already distributed justice because he spoke it that when you get persecuted and you get hated and you get killed, you get martyred, whatever it is, whatever evil is done to you, if you're in him and you're in the truth, you didn't get, nothing got stolen from you. You actually gained. Nothing was broken for you. You actually get double or, the Bible literally says, for every, like, uh, you know, for every family and member that you don't have, if you're not married, you get a hundred wives. I mean, it's not like the Muslim thing. You get 72 virgins. That's what I'm talking about. But the Bible, there's a, there's a part where Yeshua is talking about, and he says, whatever it is that you lose for my namesake, or you sacrifice or you surrender for my, you give over for my namesake, you'll get a hundred times that in heaven, right? Now, I don't think that that we should look to suffer to have heavenly gains. But what I'm saying is, is that God's already won for us. Because he spoke it so, and because tonight we're talking about how the word of God alone can get us through the end times, then that means that we can also understand that if the word of God says that whatever persecution we go through, and Yeshua says, you will be persecuted for my namesake, you will be hated for my namesake, you will be killed for my namesake, right? Okay, okay, that sucks. I'm not going to probably like going through it. But I can have a different mindset about it, understanding that I already have victory, that the justice has already been dealt out. It's I, as a believer, have had the idea that one day justice is going to be dealt out. But as we see with the temple, the, the destruction in 70 AD, the justice was already issued. It was like the, there's a balance. It's a weird balance because it glorified God in the sense that it was prophesied. Do you get what I'm trying to, how I'm trying yes. to word this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no point in any even of the bad things where God actually wasn't still glorified in it because it still pointed to him. Like, I have to say last one, just if you take a look at the Holocaust, I know what you're thinking, I'm not going to say it, but what, if you think but look at the Holocaust, a horrible thing was done onto the Jews, but the world now has a special type of sensitivity to hating on Jews. Now there's like this kind of cultural global protection against anti-Semitism. So their sacrifice and their horrific thing that happened birthed a new protection anointing on the speaking against Jews. Now if you do it, the whole world is like, oh, hey. Yeah, there's no, there's literally no other culture that is that has the kind of numbers that Jews have compared to the rest of the world that wields as much influence as Jews do. Exactly. And that's, you know, a lot of people have a lot of funny ideas about how they secretly run the world. Maybe there's some very powerful Jewish people out there. I'm not denying that. But um, as a people, that's not a thing. Yeah. Okay. I don't, I can't pick up my phone and call some super powerful Jew and get whatever I want. Yeah. For the for the vast vast ninety nine point everybody for every Jewish person that's the truth. You don't just get these special crazy powers just because you're in some kind of club. Yeah. But the truth of the matter is, because of the horrors of the Holocaust and the horrors leading up to the Holocaust, and the horrors inflicted by the Roman Empire and the burning of the temple and all of that, and the fact that Jews have been sticking to it, sticking to the scripture, and sticking to their culture for all this time and haven't lost it. There, there is become an idea now that it's, you know, there's just too much history now. People have been sensitized to the idea that you don't just go attacking the Jews uh, as, a, as a nation. Like, if you do, then that's taboo, right? Mm. And that's exactly what you would need 
in order to have this small culture birth the temple, birth one of the most important building, the most important building on earth, right? <laughs> like you need that level of awareness and sensitivity. So in fact, all the suffering the Jews have gone through have brought glory to Israel. They've brought glory to the Jews and glory to the one who has named them Israel. You see? That's is, that's my point. Yeah. So that's, that, that's a good so, place to end on, I think, yeah. because it, it just says my point. These horrible things have only brought more glory to God, and they've only forced God's hand of his will to be done more. The horrible things make God's hand, it's like they're pushing God's hand to be the will of God to be done yes. by the evil they do. So I'm not rejoicing in the evil. I'm rejoicing that God is like, they can't outdo me. They can't, they can't beat me. Every inch they push, they're forcing me to go two inches of my blessing. They're forcing me to go two inches of bringing forth my will on earth. I'm going closer to the fulfillment of my will on earth. They're not dethroning God. They're not depowering God. Right. Every evil act is increasing God's will towards his fulfillment. Which, and and real quick, this is kind a of a weird thing. But... If you needed more under more if you needed any kind of more reasoning or understanding as to why God got upset with David for wanting to take matters into his own hands and go mm. count all the soldiers and go attack the northern northern kingdom, go attack Israel, there it is. There's the there's the reasoning. That Israel the way it was was part of the plan mm -hmm. and for david to take it upon himself to go do something for god that required the massacre of the evildoers uh god wasn't happy with that move you understand you i understand what i'm getting, getting yeah. at yeah i'm asking i'm asking you understand <laughs> yeah so yeah you guys i'm gonna end i'm gonna end my my two cents i thank you so much you allowed us to do these rants you participated you you i don't know what i would have done i like I didn't know I needed this video until this video happened. I we're gonna pick back up next week with where we are. Let me just see how many we have still to do. We're about halfway. Okay, so if we'll we'll I'll post the graphic for the next one. That way we can just go right into Luke three as well. Uh, but we'll pick up where we left off and um, and uh, I just thank you. I'm I am eternally grateful, Jehovah for what you have allowed us to experience here at Yeshua Network and what you've allowed us to experience in reading the Bible together like this. This has been the most powerful experience I've ever had in my life. And I am grateful for every brother and sister that spends time in their life to come and be a blessing to us. I pray for you guys. I just want blessings to pour out on you guys because you are a blessing to me. In Yeshua's name. Hallelujah. Amen. I love you guys. We love you guys. I love this guy. Mm -hmm. We love you guys. Mm -hmm. Talk to you soon. Be blessed. Be the blessing.